Chapter 26, Tense Cooperation. Despicable. Natsum thought. Taking bodies of fallen shinobi was frowned upon even in this time period. For the Uchiha, since they have a valuable dojutsu, they are trained to destroy their eyes if ever captured by the enemy or suspect their body won't be recoverable. Over the years the ancestral tomb has received many fallen Uchiha without eyes. 1. The other Uchiha also frowned at the mention of keeping bodies. The captain spoke up, I cannot make that decision. It would be safer to just take you all out and continue with the original plan. He deflected the proposal and threatened the puppet master. You are free to try, but there are only puppets here. Even if I take down one of you, it'll be at no expense to me. These are recycled puppets either way. The puppet that was being used as a medium to speak to the Uchiha clacked its teeth up and down as if mimicking a laugh. Although the threat was real, the captain had successfully probed out the enemy. If there were only puppets here, then they would be safer to proceed either way. However, if this was a multi-layered scheme, then at least he was able to draw out the bluff. Very well. I will contact my superior. You don't mind waiting, right? Another subtle threat caused the puppet to do a full laugh again. I am very patient. Another bird was summoned and it flew the wrong way back to camp. Natsum understood this to be a tactic in case the Shirogane was actually pretending. If they determined the location of their headquarters for this raid it would be disastrous. Since the bird took a detour, it took longer to return. What surprised Natsum was that the bird returned with another Uchiha, Sahiro-san. The captain saw the new arrival and nodded toward him. Sahiro returned the nod and glanced over at Natsum to check her status. Seeing that she was okay, he was relieved. The Uchiha will cooperate under the condition that one living representative be sent over from your side. Additionally, we will not aid in securing any bodies. It is up to your own skills. Sahiro spoke in a confident, commanding tone. The puppet was quiet for a while before its mouth opened once more. The Shirogane will proceed with these arrangements. The puppet put its hands together and its torso swelled. A puff of smoke released from its various orifices and the chest cavity opened. A large, simple-looking man stepped out wearing the iconic desert outfit and face paint of the Shirogane clan. His steps were not graceful in any way as he crunched gravel with every step. HRR. He grunted towards Sahiro. A large portion of the man's head was caved in under his head covering, indicating severe brain damage. Those with Sherry non-active could see a thick chakra string attached to the base of his skull. Sahiro realized that they had been fooled, due to a loophole. However, a living puppet was not something anyone had expected. What do you think of my shadow marionette jutsu? Kageek. The puppet that had reversed summoned the living puppet spoke once more. Sahiro only scoffed in response and signaled the others to continue. Natsum and the other 29 transformation users transformed. Then, they integrated themselves with the puppets and continued the caravan forward. Due to unforeseen circumstances, the five top-ranked warriors and Sahiro silently followed the caravan, making sure to conceal themselves. While transformed, Natsum deactivated her Sherinon. Although she had advanced so far, she was still unable to keep her Sherinon up indefinitely like the older Achiha. She attributed this to her age being too young. While she walked with the caravan, the puppet came over and stared at her with its lifeless eyes. My, so young with such strong chakra. It's a shame that you aren't matured fully and cannot display your ultimate prowess. Natsum ignored the puppet as he talked. Sahiro noticed the movements and stayed a bit closer than before, ready to retaliate. What if I could solve that problem for you? The puppet continued speaking. At this Natsum's expression faltered for a split second. However, it was enough for the puppet master to notice. I can give you an immortal and invincible body. No cost at all. The puppet began to clack as if laughing again when he saw Natsum frown. 1. I will not be one of your puppets. Natsum tried to leave but was stopped by his last words. It seems that you cannot keep your dojutsu active like the others. I bet you think it is because of your body. You don't wish to be my puppet, but are unknowingly another's. Tsk tsk. The puppet started cackling its teeth again as it moved to a different Uchiha to pester. Natsum wanted to refute, but a knot formed in her through. She realized that something was strange. After rapidly awakening her Sherinon and inheriting her past life's memories, she kept making excuses for the problem. However, key moments in her life were brought to the forefront of her mind. She clearly recalled a leak during those points. She subconsciously acknowledged it but seemed to be willfully ignorant of it. Perhaps this was why the puppet master called her a puppet. Natsum reached down to her thigh, and she remembered something. It hadn't been that long since it occurred, but with all the changes she had filed it far back into her mind. Giant, intelligent white snake and a strange genjutsu of several cave entrances. A scene popped into her head from the inherited memories. A powerful shinobi with snake-like qualities summoned a giant snake, much larger and more powerful than the one she met. However, the similarities didn't end there. Next was the image of a place called the Ryakai Cave. The caves in her inherited memories were identical to the ones she saw in the genjutsu. Senjutsu, a skill that not even Madara could learn. However, there seems to be no requirement as long as you can sense and balance nature chakra. The memories came flooding in once she made the connections. All the interaction between Senjutsu users and mention of nature chakra became known to her. The most crucial bit of knowledge is Senjutsu's necessity in detecting Kagaya's remnant will, Zetsu. 3. Creator's Thoughts. Peng Incognito. Oh Natsum you have so many things to do that will help you get stronger, but what will you do right now? This partnership will shyly fail, surely. Any five head readers out there who knew that the white snake from many chapters ago was from Ryakai Cave? Chapter 27, It's a Trap? 2. Asterisk Correction in the last paragraph of the previous chapter. Thanks for pointing it out, reader, asterisk. Through the understanding of Senjutsu from her inherited memories, Natsum received a branch of knowledge about the ultimate schemer in the world, Zetsu. Based on what was in the memories, Zetsu was the cause of all the major turning points in history. It would influence Indra, and all of his reincarnations in order to revive Kagaya. It was the bane of the Achiha. 5. Learning of such a terrifying opponent that could influence people's wills and even parasitize their bodies, Natsum's desire to become stronger strengthened. Madara was its next target, and although there were no memories to support it, Natsum theorized that his life was so tragic partly due to Zetsu's influence. For now, all she could do was suppress her building rage and focus on the mission. At some point, it had started to snow. Since they were still in the winter months, the lack of snow was more surprising these last few days. 
However, this was good news for the caravan. The Shirogane shinobi had left the supplies perfectly intact since they didn't plan to do anything special with them. This allowed for the Uchiha to carefully tamper with the supplies. Since the snow started, this would increase their chances of a successful infiltration. After a day of travel, they finally re-entered the forest. Based on their estimates, the Senju Take camp should be just ahead past the ridge. Before they could get any closer, they were surrounded by warriors from the Alliance. Based on the information extracted from the Land of Fire shinobi, the puppet master had the leader release an encoded chakra flare. Upon confirmation, half of the warriors retreated, and the remainder came down to empty the carts. The disguised Uchiha helped carry the load to the camp by foot since the carts couldn't make it up the steep cliff. After a few trips, they managed to bring all the crates to the temporary storehouse in the camp. Natsum looked around and saw many enemy shinobi sitting and eating together joyfully. There is not much different from us. If not for the cycle of hatred, perhaps we could get along. Natsum pondered and understood Hashirama's ideals. Even someone like Madara could see how wasteful the current system was. She sighed and was about to retreat from the camp when she spotted some strange movements on the edge of camp. She moved quickly to see what was happening but couldn't find anything. She looked around for a moment before spotting a piece of paper stuck to the wall in the wind. It looked like a harmless object that was just caught up in the weather. However, when Natsum saw it, she was reminded of the paper Funjutsu tags from her memories. She infused a bit of chakra into the paper, and the formula was revealed for a split second. She did not understand what the formula would do but realized that things would turn bad very quickly. She attempted to rush back into camp to contact the other Uchiha when she felt a familiar presence behind her. Natsum, it's too late. You must return to the camp and inform Tajimadano. Sahiro grabbed her and twisted his body before launching her deeper into the forest. At that moment, a series of formulas appeared all over the camp and a green barrier was erected over a vast space to capture anyone. Natsum just barely made it out of the range due to being thrown. Then, the terrifying sound was heard. 1. A oh, you? Natsum's heart dropped upon seeing that familiar orange fur and terrifying scream. Kiwabai was covered in adamantium chains with a solitary figure riding his back. The man wore a white demon mask. She instantly recognized that this was an ambush by the Uzumaki. There were so many thoughts floating around in her head, her trauma resurfaced, and she found it difficult to breathe. Her father saved her instead of escaping himself. Why? Why is everyone sacrificing themselves for me? She couldn't help shouting. Her mother, Hinako, and now her father. Is this the Uchiha curse? Were they destined to watch their loved ones die one at a time? For what reason? All these questions popped up into her mind as the Kiwabai began its assault. With her sherry non, she could see hundreds of shinobi reveal themselves from the shadows. And upon closer inspection, none of them were Senju or Heitake. Ha, all the enemies have gathered unknowingly into the mouth of the beast. She mocked herself with tears in her eyes. Many people died in one go. Natsum saw some Uchiha get hit by the first attack and her heart clenched. It was only a matter of time before her father was also sacrificed. The desire to save him became the only thought in her mind. Everything happened in a sudden flash of bright light. Her Mangeku Sherry Non activated on its own and her left eye began to bleed. The world around Natsum turned into streaks of light. Nothing could be seen from behind her anymore, only a short tunnel ahead. In an instant, she arrived at the center of their headquarters. 1. Intruder. Many Uchiha surrounded Natsum as she appeared. Her transformation dissipated, revealing her form as she collapsed from the pain of using her Mangeku ability for the first time. Tajima saw her unique eyes and immediately went to her side, blocking people's line of sight. 7. It can't be. Tajima whispered, fearing the worst. The way to evolve to the Mangeku was clear to him, and he assumed she had just awakened it. The most impactful was the death of a loved one. Tajima, please save them. The camp. Trap. Her churning stomach and intense pain caused her to vomit blood. Everyone, gear up. Begin to mobilize. However, he frowned. The distance was too far to make it in time. He looked down at Natsum, and they made eye contact. Her Mangeku was still active. He seemed to give her a questioning gaze, and she bit her lip before nodding. I can do it. She replied confidently. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Don't flame me for making her cry all the time. I know some people prefer a cold-blooded murderous MC. Well, tough. Natsum can be badass and emotional at the same time. Plus she's just a kid. Chapter 28, Previous Generation. The remaining top rank warriors arrived, and Tajima sealed off the meeting space. Natsum was anxious to get moving and she kept fidgeting with her fingers. Tajima placed his hand on her shoulder and consoled her. Do not fret. Sahiro-san is not as weak as you think. Tajima consoled her. She thought about how her father's status had risen and had a thought. If he also had the Mangeku, he would indeed be able to put up a fight for a while. But the time he would have awoken means he has not had much practice. The only way to defeat a controlled Kyuubai was Genjutsu or Suzanu. Then, there was still facing the Uzumaki after. Tell us the details of the attack. Natsum was anxious to go so she spoke quickly. After describing everything in detail, he nodded toward one of the other Uchiha and he left immediately. How many can you take? He didn't want to ask too many details about her Mangeku, so he kept the question simple and direct. Natsum calculated based on how much Dojutsu power and chakra it took to take just herself and came up with a number. Three safely, but four should be my maximum. Once he confirmed this, he decided to wait a little longer. With such a limited number of people, he had to take the strongest. Tajimasama. However, before she could continue, another Uchiha arrived that Natsum was familiar with. Tajimadano, I have brought him. The Uchiha announced as he came in. Hideyoshi-sama, I am sorry to call upon you. Tajima looked embarrassed as the older Uchiha librarian stepped forward. Natsum had noted how he never seemed to be needed on the front and started to figure out why. His eyes turned red, and a six-blade pinwheel pattern appeared on his eyes. However, the color of his pupils had faded, indicating he could hardly see. It is this old man's duty to protect the younger generation in a time of need. I have one more fight in me. He looked over at Natsum's eyes and nodded in approval. The younger generation will overtake us. Jun has already informed me of the details. I am sure you are anxious to go, Natsum-chan. With that, Tajima, Natsum, and Hideyoshi stood together. Natsum looked back and visualized the edge of the encampment just within the border of the barrier. 
Her pupil dilated and all of the light in the room was extinguished. A long tunnel appeared in the field of view of Tajima, Natsum, and Hideyoshi. Since it was the second time she used it, her control was significantly better. Fukakoma. The name of her ability appeared in her mind by instinct and she was compelled to say it. As if responding to her words, the three of them were propelled forward in an instant. It was as if the two points were connected by a single step. Natsum's eye began bleeding once more and she was forced to close it due to the strain. Once the tunnel of light closed, the three were standing on piles of destroyed rock. 1. Incredible. Rest up, let this old man handle the rest. Everyone could see the giant Kyuabai still causing havoc. It had only been a few minutes since the attack started, but the whole camp was obliterated. Tajima and Hideyoshi were able to discover the location where the Uchiha were gathered easily because a giant blue skeleton held Kyuabai in a choke hold. Tajima carried Natsum and protected her while she recovered. Tajima Dano. One of the Uchiha called out when they saw the arrival of the trio. Seeing the group of Uchiha were safe, Natsum sighed in relief. Although a few were missing, the majority were still alive. The guilt in her heart lessened a little. Oh ho, two newcomers in my time. What a terrible time for Uchiha it must have been. I hope there comes a day no Uchiha must awaken this cursed dojutsu. Hideyoshi lamented as he drew his long katana. His eyes spun and activated. Oyuri. A shroud of red surrounded his body, fully equipping him in armor like a full Suzano. Masamun. The same red chakra surrounded his katana. He raised his arms and swung down with his katana with two hands. Sensing a familiar chakra, Ashina immediately ordered Kyuabai to retreat and defend. However, Sahiro noticed this and pushed his eyes to the limit, causing Suzana's arms to grow muscles and lock Kyuabai in a tighter hold. As the sword dropped, a giant spectral sword appeared behind Hideyoshi which seemed to mirror his katana. It slammed the Kyuabai into the ground, breaking it free from Sahiro's Suzana from the sheer force. The shockwave blasted out in all directions, but a spectral armor appeared around the group of Uchiha, protecting them from the blast. Natsum watched the battle and gulped. This was on a level higher than she had ever experienced. She wondered if the epic battles from her memories felt like this. Hideyoshi, I thought you were dead. Ashina called out to him from atop the Kyuabai's head. He seemed completely unscathed from the previous attack. Kyuabai roared in anger and attempted to break free from the chains. However, Ashina didn't give it a chance and bound them tighter. How could I die when you're still alive? They didn't need any more words. A fully suited Suzano appeared around Hideyoshi and the Kyuabai and Suzano clashed. The ground quaked and crumbled at every clash. Meanwhile, Hideyoshi and Ashina were battling in the air above the two giants. They gradually left the main area and began to fight at the edge of the barrier. This gave a chance for the rest of the Uzumaki shinobi to come in and clean up the battlefield. Over half of the foreign shinobi were eliminated from the initial ambush, the injured ones were quickly dispatched. A thick killing intent was directed toward the Uchiha, and a group ran toward them. Sahiro had already returned to their side and saw Natsum was here again. He was going to reprimand her when he saw her eyes. Thinking that he had caused her to awaken in grief, he decided not to say anything. Father and daughter looked at each other's mangekyus and understood the other's pain without needing to speak. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Bonus chapter for the holidays. A little history on my research. For the name of her left eye's ability, in one of the myths involving Amaterasu, she was chilling at home knitting when one day her annoying brother Suzano threw a horse into her house. She got really mad because this was not the first prank he did, and decided to shut herself in, taking all the light from the world with her. That horse is called a no Fukakoma or heavenly spotted horse. Chapter 29, Unexpected Foe. Natsum and Sahiro were going to fight together but several Kunal landed in between them with explosive tags. They went off almost instantly, causing them to dodge away from each other. A shadow appeared before her in the direction she dodged. Fortunately, she slashed her sword out to block the incoming fist. Meanwhile, Sahiro was already engaged in a 10 versus 1 battle with the Uzumaki warriors. Natsum wanted to assist him, but the large-robed figure blocked her way. Natsum recognized him right away as the puppet that the Shirogane puppet master summoned. The hair on the back of her neck stood and she instinctually sidestepped. A thousand needles scattered across the ground. The soil turned purple as poison spread out. She repositioned herself and saw the two puppets standing before her. Ho ho, your eyes are quite interesting. This is fate. Once I turn you into a living puppet, you will be my ultimate weapon. The puppet chattered its mouth up and down again. That mocking fake laugh annoyed Natsum every time she saw it. Without wasting any time, she made hand signs and released a dozen balls of orange flames. Seeing this, the main puppet's elbow compartments opened, causing its forearms to swing backward. From within, two tubes stuck out. A stream of limestone powder shot out smothering the balls of flame. Natsum saw this and realized that this would directly suppress any fire release user. Any other fire user would have to fight a battle of attrition or use a different strategy. The limestone powder put out the immediate flames, causing the puppets to stop focusing on that and attempt a counterattack. However, when the blobs landed on the ground and splashed in all directions, they reignited in renewed fervor. The flames clung to everything, destroying the heavy robe around the main puppet revealing its true form. As for the living puppet, a large burn wound festered along his arm. 1. Interesting, a Kekai Jenkai only makes me want your body even more. 2. The puppet's six arms that were now revealed each brandished a dark black blade. The puppet's speed were unlike before. Natsum realized that he had not been taking her seriously before. Fortunately, her eyes allowed her to keep up with their movements. The only issue was her body couldn't keep up with her eyes. Her chakra reserves were quickly being depleted which caused her alarm. Hehe, <laughs> looks like the parasite has given you to me on a silver platter. The puppet's sword dance was fascinating. It was a technique that Natsum had never seen. She tried to deflect as much as possible, even severing two of the puppet's arms. However, she still received several small cuts all over her body. Normally this wouldn't be an issue, but the Shirogane specialized in poisons. She could feel her body becoming weaker and weaker. As a shinobi, her poison tolerance was very good, but it only lasted so long. She could not match up to the puppets. Every time she tried to cut the chakra strings, the living puppet would block her with his body. Any strings she removed would be replaced with a string from the thick bundle attached to the living puppet. Although this decreased the control of the living puppet, it was an impossible battle of attrition. The red scorpion venom is the main ingredient in my poison. You have done well to last this long, but it'll only be a matter of time before full body paralysis sets in. Natsum gritted her teeth. She didn't want to use Suzano because she was afraid of the consequences, but she couldn't think of a solution. You foolish Uchiha really should have just destroyed my puppets when you had a chance. Thinking about the caravan, she suddenly thought of something. 
When she awakened her eyes, she only received a brief understanding of their capabilities. Their true potential would need to be discovered on her own. She understood from her inherited memories that her first ability was very good in the current era, but her second ability was a bit vaguer. However, her gut told her that this was the best moment to use it. If I can't defeat your puppets, then go after the puppet master. Natsum thought. Her right eye rotated rapidly and her dojutsu power plummeted. The poorly lit forest suddenly became radiant. Every shadow and corner was revealed to her. She felt as if she were looking down at everything from the heavens, but simultaneously from any angle she wished. The whole forest was under her observation. Zenkaizen. The name appeared in her mind. The first thing she saw was the cart and caravan, it was still intact. The next was a lone Shirogane clan member hiding in the hollow of a tree with a hundred chakra strings extending toward the battlefield. He was an old and decrepit man with one foot in the grave. His body had even been modified with puppet techniques. 7. Natsum saw everything all at once. The information seemed overwhelming, but her dojutsu allowed her mind to process it without issue. Without any delay, she activated her left eye and smiled at the puppets. With both eyes working in tangent, she was able to activate Fukakoma from a different position. The thousands of explosive tags turned into streaks of light before appearing around the tree that the puppet master was hiding in. In order to secure the mission success, each Uchiha had the ability to trigger the tags from a distance. Natsum formed a hand seal and started laughing. Boom. Everyone paused for a moment when, in the distance, thousands of explosive tags went off which shook the forest. The puppets went slack, and Natsum didn't take a chance and instantly released another jutsu to destroy them. Their bodies turned to ash under the intense heat, and she collapsed on the ground breathing heavily. Her chakra was dangerously low, and her eyes felt like they were being pierced by a thousand needles. She looked at her arms and saw they were beginning to turn purple from the poison. She also felt that she couldn't withstand another activation of her dojutsu. She let her sherry non revert back to her normal eyes to preserve her strength. At that moment, she detected the difference in chakra drain and tore her pant leg. A lifelike snake tattoo was curled up. It covered nearly her whole leg from ankle to hip. She stabbed the head of the snake with a kunai while rapidly expelling chakra from her tenkutsu. HSSS. The snake jumped off her leg and transformed into the same white snake she saw in the genjutsu. It seems you are going to die. How? Delicious. 2. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. So Zenkaizen kind of means omniscient all-knowing or almighty based on my research. We see use of this word in a few other animes, so I decided to steal it as all good artists do. Chapter 30, Genjutsu Trial. If not for you, I would be fine. Natsum rolled her eyes. The poison was making her head foggy, and she was losing control of her muscles. HSS, you would still fail, with a little more chakra. The snake calmly watched Natsum as her breathing became more labored. No one was free to assist her. Unknowingly, the battle between her and the puppets had led her so far from the camp. However, Natsum wasn't afraid. She closed her eyes and waited to accompany her mother, brother, and Hinako. The snake slithered up her body and hissed directly at her face. HSSS, why, you could have been so delicious. Why do you not fear death? The snake became upset. This whole scheme of slowly drawing from her chakra in order to put her in this kind of situation eventually. Sure, the chakra was tasty, but nothing was tastier than the fear of death right at the moment of crossing over. Impossible, I've never encountered a human like you. Cough, why? Well, everyone will, die eventually. Cough. Although she felt regretful for not being able to fulfill her ambitions and would fail her promise to Madara and the clan, in the face of death, she felt eerily peaceful. It was not a conscious sensation, but rather something deep down within her that no longer feared dying. Perhaps it is because she had inherited the memories of her past life and has already experienced death once. 2. Wouldn't I just be reincarnated again? Maybe I won't remember who I am, but my spirit will live on. Natsum wondered. A puff of smoke appeared over her body and a scroll unraveled. It was suspended vertically so that Natsum could see the contents of the scroll. When she saw that it was a summoned beast contract with the snake, Natsum saw the name on the scroll and wanted to laugh at herself for not realizing it. However, that fragment of memories was a bit isolated and there was less emotional attachment to them. What is, this? Natsum asked. I can save you, if you sign this contract. However, Natsum already saw the stipulations. She was the second party on the contract. Her pride wouldn't allow her to do such a thing. Natsum closed her eyes and let death creep up closer. This time, she was bluffing. Realizing who the snake in front of her was, Natsum had a plan. Ah, what a waste, your chakra was tastier before. The white snake seemed to struggle with the situation. I will only sign, cough, if it is, fair. Natsum tried to sound nonchalant despite her difficulty breathing. The snake seemed to be pondering something before it bit her neck. The venom moved rapidly and gave her some relief from her symptoms. Then, the surroundings changed, and she was in a classroom. Natsum felt this place looked familiar, as if it were something from deep within her subconscious. However, Natsum still had her self-awareness, and due to the memories, she was certain that this was a trial. Soon, people began to enter the classroom. The first was Sahiro. He was wearing a brown coat with elbow patches. He stepped up to the chalkboard and began to write. What he wrote was all the things Natsum failed at. Each one was more painful than the next. And at the very last line, not saving Hinako. How can you save the Uchiha when you've already failed to save all of these people, Natsum? He spoke in a strict voice. I may not be strong enough now, but I will never lose my conviction. Sahiro narrowed his eyes and left the room. Next was Tajima. He pointed out her failures in training. And in big letters Genjutsu underlined three times. How can you become stronger when you can't even master the Uchiha signature technique? Natsum bit her lip. It was true that she put off learning Genjutsu because she was bad at it. However, she shook her head and didn't let the doubts flood her mind. 1. You're wrong. An Uchiha doesn't need Genjutsu to become powerful. I will prove it. 1. Tajima harumphed and left the room. Next was Kono. She walked in holding Madara. She didn't write anything on the board and simply stared at her child. How can you save Madara when you don't even have the will to save yourself? Natsum's eyes widened and she stopped breathing. The long pause and the words that Kono spoke shocked her. She suddenly thought about her complacency to death and realized how hypocritical she was. How could she promise to protect Kono and Madara when she couldn't even protect herself? She wanted to become stronger but gave up and accepted death peacefully. Even in death, Madara fought tooth and nail until he gained enlightenment. You're right, then I will not allow myself to die. I will fight to my last breath. 
I will struggle so that no one else has to. She spoke out her determination and something within her changed. Just as the dream was fading, the room became populated with people she didn't recognize. Then, she turned her head and saw a bright flash of light. The classroom was vaporized in the light, including herself. 3. The Genjutsu abruptly ended and Natsum returned to the battlefield. At some point, the snake had set up a barrier so that they wouldn't be disturbed. However, it also meant that no one would come to her aid. The scroll above her was gone and once she exited from the Genjutsu, the snake hissed, and a new contract appeared. The contract was that Natsum would feed the snake her chakra regularly, and when summoned, the snake would aid her in battle, and then eat the enemies they defeated as payment. Although the terms were slightly in the snakiest favor, Natsum didn't hesitate to bite her finger and place her imprint on the scroll. She felt a sudden influx of chakra that was expelling the poison. The chakra she felt was very familiar, because it was her own. She felt a bit annoyed that this was considered only a small amount. However, knowing the identity of this little snake made her very proud. Tejitsuim, I look forward to our cooperation. 5. Equals 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 equals. New base rate, 1 every 2 days. Bonus chapters, 2 unique reviews plus 1 chap. Top 10 power stones, plus 1 chap. 3. Top 3 power stones, plus 1 chap. First rated in power stones, 1 slash day while first base rate. 4. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Yay summon get? You guys are so nice, thanks for reading 3. Chapter 31, Q of I's retaliation. The flow of chakra ended, but there was still some poison in her body. It wasn't enough to cause her problems anymore, but before Natsum could complain, Tejitsuim hissed. That was all I took. Our contract has been established. I will go back now. Don't call on me if you can't pay. Natsum understood what she meant. Unless she planned to kill a lot of enemies, Tejitsuim didn't want to be involved. However, there was nothing in the contract about returning the chakra she fed on. Natsum would explore the relationship with this snake later, for now, she turned her attention back to the battlefield. After Tejitsuim reverse summoned herself, the barrier went down. It seemed that a lot more time had passed than she expected. The Genjutsu must have lasted longer than she perceived. Hideyoshi and Ashina's battle was still ongoing, but their clashes were getting weaker compared to their first attacks. As for Sahiro and the other Uchiha, they were struggling to fend off against the group of Uzumaki. Fortunately, alliances are made under strange circumstances. The other clans that tried to take advantage of the situation were fighting with the Uchiha to drive back the Uzumaki. In a rare moment of opportunity, there was cooperation with enemies. Natsum saw the light of the future and realized why the world was able to unite against a common threat. Perhaps the only real way to unite the ninja world was an enemy that no one could defeat alone. 2. Natsum would have joined the fighting right away, but she was still weakened from lack of chakra and the remnant poison. She focused on molding chakra to purge the rest of the poison from her body while she watched the battle. The best thing she could do for the clan was to save her strength and help them evacuate. What drew her attention the most was the fight between Ashina and Hideyoshi. In her memories, Kunjutsu seemed to wane in favor of ninjutsu. This was likely due to the systematic propagation of jutsu through the academy. However, in time of war, physical skills were more valuable. This was why mostly every warrior in this era was skilled with some form of physical combat. However, compared to the cage level experts from her memories, the Teijutsu and Kenjutsu ceiling in her era was too low. It's no wonder why Madara and Hashirama were able to quickly become the most powerful in the world. But this couldn't be blamed on the lack of talent, but lack of growth and knowledge. Most of the fighting techniques in the warring states period were learned on the battlefield so they were optimized for fighting wars. There was also a lack of whetstone opponents. In a battle, one person would die, or the fight wouldn't end. Unlike in her memory where people would often escape or be rescued. How ironic. She thought about how she was rescued not too long ago. Perhaps the generation that contains the reincarnation of Ashura and Indra would be protected by some strange power. She thought about the sage of six paths that still existed in the world, waiting for the seal to his mother to be broken. What a lonely existence. The missing Tajima arrived with a sneak attack, killing one of the Uzumaki. Natsum wasn't close enough to hear what he was saying and her Sherinan was deactivated to read his lips, but Sahiro nodded his head. He activated his Suzano and grabbed all the Uchiha in the area. The Uzumaki tried to break through the blue skeleton but were unable to pass the absolute defense. The group of Uchiha in the arm of Suzano ran toward Natsum. She understood the intention and jumped onto the skeleton's shoulder. Natsum, I'm glad to see you are okay. I lost track of your chakra for a while, I was afraid. Tajima had left her almost immediately after arriving and she hadn't even noticed his departure. Natsum gave him a nod. I am fine. The Shirogane clan ambushed me, but I took care of it. Tajima, where did you go? I don't believe that this camp was just a big trap. After looking around, I discovered some interesting things. Now it is time for the Uchiha to retreat and let the rest of the clan suffer. But how will we escape? Natsum couldn't bring this many people with Fukakoma, but Tajima just remained silent. She guessed he had some plan so she didn't say anything further and continued to mold Chakra. The poison was almost completely purged and she could begin fighting once more. However, Sahiro suddenly stopped and turned. Oh no. Everyone turned as well after feeling the mass of Chakra. Natsum activated her normal Sherinan to observe the situation with Hideyoshi and saw that Ashina had lost control of Kyuabai for a moment due to the intense battle. One of Hideyoshi's eyes was completely white, but he managed to make a lethal blow to Ashina. Natsum saw this and she thought of the forbidden technique, Izanagi. Due to losing his eye, he was unable to use Suzano, but it allowed him to put in a significant blow to Ashina. However, the Uchiha weren't focused on that, but the Kyuabai's first act now that it was free. 1. By Juudama. Everyone shouted simultaneously. Due to the angle and positioning of the Kyuabai, it would hit Ashina, Hideyoshi, the camp, and the fleeing Uchiha. Sahiro wasn't confident in blocking a fully formed by Juudama with his Suzano. The mass of Chakra was far greater than anything anyone had seen before. Natsum realized that the last time she saw the by Juudama, he wasn't trying very hard. Natsum gritted her teeth. In her memories, she saw one of the future Hokage teleport away the Kyuabai's by Juudama and had inspiration. Her ability wasn't a space-time technique like Kamui, but it should work just the same. And since she can activate Fukakoma and Zenkaisen together, she could move it away without getting close. Instead of trying to flee, Hideyoshi grabbed Ashina from behind and held him directly in front of the blast zone. You madman. Hehe, <laughs> it's time for the young to take over. Us old men should quietly move on. 1. Equals 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 equals. Bonus chapter fulfilled. Creator's thoughts. 
Peng Incognito. Sai, Karema is bullied by the ninjas so much in his time. The review that triggered the bonus was kinda unfair. I can make an op female MC puffs out cheeks. Chapter 32, Secrets of Sherry Non. Nats embraced herself to redirect the blast with her Mangeku. However, the world suddenly was plunged in an eerie white light. Natsum felt a familiar chill from the sudden change. No one understood what was happening until a giant, plump white-robed spirit appeared above Ashina. The face of this spirit was identical to the mask he was wearing. The Baijuudama finally finished collecting chakra as Kyuabai swallowed it in order to turn the blast into a focused cone. As the blast was released, Ashina was the first to receive the hit. The giant spirit above him stood without moving, while Ashina's blazing red hair turned white rapidly. Meanwhile, Haijushi was completely obliterated by the point-blank Baijuudama. As the blast continued forward, Natsum's eyes spun and transformed to Mangeku. However, before she could activate her abilities, Sahiro stepped forward with his Mangeku. Kodaki, a pair of spectral doors appeared, one in front of Suzano and one behind Suzano. When the blast encountered the door, it instantly appeared on the other side as if there was no space between the two spots. The blast continued onward and blasted into the barrier. A shattering sound could be heard as the barrier was destroyed from the powerful blast. 1. Natsum looked over at her father and saw his eye was bleeding and closed. She didn't understand the limitations of his ability, but it seemed to take a huge toll on him as Suzano was fading away. As for the enemy clans fighting in the center along with the remaining Uzumaki, some managed to escape but most were obliterated by the blast. Once the smoke cleared, only Ashina could be seen kneeling on the ground, his hair ash white. The spirit had gone and Kyuabai made a move to finish Ashina off. Unfortunately, two Uzumaki warriors arrived and picked Ashina up by his arms and fled the scene. Kyuabai roared in anger and continued destroying the area in anger. The Uchiha were about to leave when they detected a familiar, albeit weak, chakra signature from Hideyoshi. He appeared like a phantom at the edge of the battlefield. Tajima appeared at his side and caught him. Hideyoshi. He saw the two blank eyes and realized what he had done. That damned old fossil still had another trick under his sleeve. Sai, let's head back. He didn't even acknowledge his blind eyes and continued cursing at his old enemy. Natsum saw how Hideyoshi sacrificed both his eyes to Izanagi and sighed. The Kyuabai was still causing destruction in the area, so the group decided to retreat right away. Once they were far enough away, they decided to rest. Of the original 35 Uchiha that went on the mission, only 29 remained. One of the top-ranking and five mid-ranking warriors were killed. Regardless, any loss was unacceptable. One of the Uchiha that died was only 14, he hadn't even had a chance to start a family before dying on the battlefield. While resting, Hideyoshi took Natsum and Sahiro to the side and had a private conversation with them. The topic was about the Mangeku Sherinan. Since he was no longer able to participate in the highest level battles, it was time to pass on the knowledge only he could. This is how the oral tradition of the forbidden Uchiha Jutsu was passed. No one dared to write down these Jutsu in fear that they would be discovered by the enemy. You must never share this information with anyone that has not awakened Mangekyo. Only after understanding the pain can these forbidden Jutsu be used responsibility. The first ability is one that I have shown in battle, is an Age. By sacrificing the light of one of your eyes, you can cast a Genjutsu on reality itself. With this, you can overwrite your death. The extent of this ability is based on the strength of your dojutsu. Stronger Sherry Non will allow for a longer rewrite time and delay. Natsum nodded as she listened although she already knew the information. Hideyoshi explained the way to activate it. The process was complicated enough not to accidentally activate it. Natsum was impressed by Madara of the future. Based on the timeline in her memories, this knowledge would have had to have been either passed down by a non mangeku Sherry Non user or written down. And since there were non Uchiha capable of using Izanaga from her memories, she guessed that it was written down. Hideyoshi-sama, is there no record of these abilities at all? Sahiro asked. The birthplace of Uchiha, the Naka Shrine has record of these abilities, but they are not a detailed explanation. They are more of a record of the origin and the possibility of such an ability. It was our ancestors that later discovered the forbidden Jutsu in trying times. However, there were those who would abuse this ability and steal Sherry Non from their fellow clansmen. Izanagi is not without flaws. Its sister Jutsu, Izanami is used to punish those who would abuse the forbidden Jutsu. It is also a very powerful Genjutsu that can permanently trap its victim in an endless loop. After explaining how to activate Izanami, Hideyoshi continued to explain a few more details about Mangeku. Hideyoshi explained the price of using Mangeku and all of its associated abilities. He stressed to reserve it as a final trump card rather than relying on it as their primary combat power. However, Natsum noticed he didn't mention anything about the eternal Mangeku Sherry Non. She wondered if it was unknown knowledge. Is there no way to counter the blindness? Natsum asked, curiously. She knew the answer from her memories, or rather, had a conjecture based on the two instances of eternal Mangeku she knew. There was also the association with Hashirama's cells and the Mangeku Sherry Non from her memories. It seemed that it could repair the damage in the eyes from overuse, since Uchiha Obito overused the ability without cost. Thinking of this irresponsible Uchiha from her inherited memories caused her to sigh. However, in the end, it was her generation's Madara that was the root of all the Uchiha's problems later. There is a way, however, you would need to visit the shrine to learn more about it. In my anger as a youth, I did not take the warning seriously. I was so blinded by hatred that I became known as the Uchiha's Red Devil. Hehe, he, those were the days. 2. Hideyoshi was tired after the explanation and went to rest. Meanwhile, Natsum and Sahiro sat together in silence. They didn't know what to say so they didn't. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter, 2 unique reviews plus 1 chap. Top 10 Power Stones, plus 1 chap. Top 3 Power Stones, plus 1 chap. First rated in Power Stones, 1 slash day while first base rate. Creator's Thoughts, Peng Incognito. Those that expected a big battle like Ashina to die from this, sorry, but he took quite a big hit. There is this theory that relatives will have similar Sherry non-abilities, and I think this comes more from a mental state than a blood thing. You think similarly to your siblings and parents because of the environment you grew up in, so there would be similar powers. Chapter 33, Promotion. 
The snow started to intensify until it was a full-blown blizzard. The ground piled high with snow up to waist height. Despite being trained shinobi, they still found it difficult to travel in those conditions. Because of this, it took them another two days to return to headquarters. During that time, the camp had upgraded to more permanent structures. Seeing this, Natsum realized that this mission was far from over. Natsum had fully cleared the poison from her body at this point and discovered her sherry non was a lot more stable and sustainable than before. Due to being parasitized before, she was unable to get the full potential of her strength. But now it felt as if her power exploded from being suppressed for so long. However, she attributed part of that rapid growth to her finally using her mangiku. Although blindness was a side effect, it would still become stronger with more use in the early stages. After getting another day of rest in camp, Tajima called for a general meeting of all the warriors. Natsum noticed that a portion was not there. She guessed they were sent back to strengthen the clan's defenses. Tajima explained to everyone what had occurred on the last mission. Everyone was impressed and some were saddened to hear of Hideyoshi's state. Next, I would like to announce Uchiha Sahiro and Uchiha Natsum as entering the top rank warriors of the clan. From now on, they shall hold authority below me and in seniority order with their fellow top-ranking warriors. They have proven themselves in battle despite their lacking chakra reserves. Any that object, speak up now. No one had any issues with the two father and daughter. They didn't think there was any issue with Tajima's decision. If he said they proved themselves, then they naturally would agree. If this were in the clan, some of the civilian leaders might have issues. But everyone currently in the camp were warriors that spilled blood for the clan. Everyone cheered to have two new powerful warriors. Natsum was not surprised. Since they had shown mastery over Mangeku Sherry non to many Uchiha, then not promoting them would be profaning the Dojutsu. Being a top rank warrior gave her a lot more autonomy in the clan. Since the general trend between the clans was to hold back their strongest forces, Natsum would have the option to not enter a war immediately. This meant she could spend more time increasing her skills. This was a very important dynamic in the current world since the small differences between top-ranking warriors were vital to the ultimate outcome of a battle. Many top-ranking warriors spent every day constantly improving themselves, this was why they were hardly seen in the clan. Although their room for growth was limited, even a 1% increase in strength could topple the scales. However, this autonomy had limits. The current clan leader could always summon them to battle, as is the case for the current mission. During the attack on the joint camp, I investigated the ruins. I discovered several encrypted documents. During the last few days, we have successfully deciphered them and have confirmed the existence of the gold mine. However, the location was a trap. It seems that we chose the least dangerous ambush site. The fake gold mine site contained the main force of the Senju clan with some minor allied clans. 4. The real gold mine is further south in the tiny country called Land of Rice Fields. It seems that the daimyo of this tiny country discovered the gold mine in their borders, and knowing they couldn't protect it, reached out to the Land of Fire. The information ends there. Once the weather clears, we will move out. Jun, Riko, go ahead and scout the area. The two nodded their heads and disappeared. The Uchiha finished listening to Tajima's explanation and felt excited. They were worried that this was all a farce and the built-up energy from the mission would be wasted. However, now they had something to look forward to. Everyone wanted to leave immediately to fight, but the weather was just too intense. It would be a waste of energy. Everyone is dismissed. Rest well until the snow settles down. Sahiro, Natsum, stay behind. The Uchiha saluted Tajima and left for their respective huts. After everyone was gone, Tajima sat down and sighed. Do you think it is foolhardy to continue pursuing this mission? Sahiro frowned and replied immediately, It is not my place to question or comment on the leader's decision. Hearing his response, Tajima sighed again. However, Natsum did not say anything and instead had a thoughtful expression. Normally, she would be of the same opinion as her father. However, with her inherited memories, she acquired some unique worldviews. Tajima-sama, it may be foolish to continue. Natsum. Sahiro cut her off, but Tajima waved his hand to let her finish speaking. Speak. As I said, it may be foolish, however, it is exactly that reason as to why it is a good idea. Oh, elaborate. Natsum wasn't very confident in her analysis, but she had good instinct and a vast amount of knowledge from a whole lifetime of memories. The enemies this time are certain they have dealt us a severe blow. This, combined with the weather, would make them certain of our retreat. Actually, even if they predict that we may attack, they will likely expect us to wait until summer. Why summer? Tajima seemed to already understand but was trying to figure out how developed Natsum's skills were. Well, the spring right after heavy snowfall would leave the land of rice fields flooded in many places and muddy in others. Since the Senju mainly use earth and water release, while the Uchiha mainly use fire release, they wouldn't think us so reckless to attack with such a disadvantage. This is also because historically, the Uchiha prefer to battle in the summer. Well spoken, Natsum-san. Your analysis and understanding of war rival my own. Perhaps I should promote you to the war council. Tajima-sama, I wouldn't dare. Natsum humbled herself. She had some thoughts, but it was not comprehensive knowledge. We will discuss that more in the future. For now, I want you two to return to the ancestral grounds and visit the Naka Shrine. Natsum and Sahiro were momentarily surprised before replying simultaneously, Yes Tajima-sama. Equals 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 equals. Bonus chapter, Creator's Thoughts. Peng Incognito. Thank you so much for the sweet words, it makes me really happy, Dadabia. I had the idea for this fanfic for a while but was really scared to start posting it, so it means a lot to me to get such great support. Chapter 34, Uchiha Heritage. Over the years, the Uchiha have had to move their main base several times when it has been discovered by enemy clans. However, the location of the Naka Shrine has always been a well-guarded secret of the Uchiha. As the birthplace of the Uchiha clan, it is considered a sacred site. Tajima gave them a map of its location and Natsum was surprised to see how deep into the land of fire the shrine really was. Although the snow was bothersome, it only required some chakra expenditure to travel in. Natsum and Sahiro traveled at an even pace, making sure not to accidentally encounter any enemy shinobi along the way. Due to the existence of the Kiwabai and many other dangerous beasts deep in the land of fire, most did not venture out that far. The shrine's location was just on the edge of the marked danger zone. 
However, since the Qubai was recently manipulated, this may not matter anymore. It is known that over the centuries, the Qubai has been a weapon of powerful shinobi several times. Natsum understood why Karama was so angry with mankind. If she were treated as a mindless beast for all of her existence, she would start to behave as such out of spite. In order to save time, the two traveled through the night and didn't stop to rest. After the first full day of travel, Sahiro was the first to break the silence. They had stopped at a river, and after a quick fire jutsu, refilled their water supplies. While Natsum was crouched by the waterside, he began to speak. Natsum, I am sorry for sending you out of the camp. He still believed that his act of self-sacrifice in order to save her had triggered her Mangekyou. Although apologizing was meaningless, the guilt was eating away at him. Since he too had the Mangekyou, he understood what kind of terrible power it was. The pain of using its abilities paled to the pain it took to awaken the eyes. You did what you felt was right. Natsum didn't think anything of it and just felt that Sahiro got bored of the quiet. In the moment, she was hurt and frustrated, but thinking back, it was the most logical decision. Natsum was still young and had a lot more room for growth. The future of the Uchiha clan would be better secured by protecting the younger generation. If she couldn't understand that logic, her plans would be pointless. Rather than being consoled, Sahiro instead felt worse. Being pragmatic and cynical was also a defense mechanism that he employed. He did not want his daughter to live an emotionless life like he would be fated to. She was still so young and had not even had a chance to experience life beyond war. And now that she was a powerhouse of the Uchiha, it would be even harder to find time for love. Natsum, as a father, I have failed you in many ways. However, I hope to one day see you smiling while I hold my grandchildren. The curse of our clan is systemic, but it is also something that we ourselves allow. Hate is something that is easy to experience, but love requires courage, courage that I didn't have as a youth. This is the true strength of our Uchiha clan, finding love and happiness in the darkness. Since she behaved so maturely and even had the strength to support herself as an adult, many forgot that she was still a child. Although the concept of children was a bit more blurred in the warring period, the kind of things that Sahiro was discussing with Natsum at this time were very awkward. She closed her eyes tightly and pinched the area between her brows. Father, I'm only 10 years old. Hearing this response, Sahiro couldn't help but start coughing. He nearly fell over. After a while he started laughing. It was a genuine and hearty laugh. Yes, that's right. I forgot because you are so mature. Whatever decision you make, I will support. Sahiro realized that his concerns were for naught. He could feel that the turmoil within him was not something that Natsum had. Perhaps her youth was an advantage for her. She did not have years of accumulated experience and could still grow past the pain and sadness. After a while, Natsum took the initiative to speak. Father, what if we discover something, terrible at the shrine? While Sahiro was worried about her love life, Natsum was thinking about something else the whole journey. He frowned and didn't understand her meaning. What could be so terrible at the sacred site? Sahiro didn't understand her question. Natsum bit her lip and continued. What if the records at the shrine ask us to do something like, sacrifice Uchiha in order to prevent the blindness? She wasn't very good at being subtle and directly asked the question she had on her mind. It wasn't a conjecture, since she knew the answer already. Impossible. Our ancestors would not have kept the sacred records if it had that kind of text. Seeing her anxious look, he sighed and thought about it. If that is so, then I would willingly sacrifice myself rather than being able to see once more. Natsum had a suspicion that he would answer like that. She frowned and began to weigh to herself whether she could continue living if that happened. Madara had turned into a monster because of what happened to his brother. She believed she was stronger emotionally, but this was perhaps overconfidence due to her inherited memories. Natsum could not claim to know how she would be if that situation would arise in the future. Although he would likely reject the knowledge, there would be moments in battle where Sahiro may choose to give her his eyes as a last resort. In the heat of battle, she would not be able to stop him. She could already picture the scene in her mind. She is exhausted and on the verge of losing or death, and the same is true for her father. Then, he turns to her and in an instant of surprise, he has already passed her his light. It was cliche. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter, two unique reviews plus one chap. Top 10 power stones, plus one chap. Top 3 power stones, plus one chap. First rated in power stones, one slash day while first base rate. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Oh my gosh I wrote this in the hour before work, and I'm about to be late. I just woke up with inspiration and had to write. Anyway, hope you enjoy it. Chapter 35, Ancestral Grounds. It looks like the shrine is close. Sahiro said while inspecting the map. They had already been traveling for a day and got lost a few times. Fortunately, they were both perceptive enough to realize it and doubled back. The snow didn't let up at any point in their trip so they each had a thin layer of frost along their uniforms. Natsum was looking on ahead while Sahiro inspected the map. Something about this area gave her a strange sense of deja vu. There was a small clearing on rocky terrain that continued forward in a slight upward slope. She started moving forward on her own. After a while, she reached the edge of the cliff. The cliff face was huge and wrapped around a quite a distance. She looked down and saw the large area of lightly wooded forest. Although the snow blanketed the terrain, Natsum instantly recognized where she stood. Hokage Rock. Then the area below is the location of the future Kanaha. She felt a strange feeling about standing on the cliff face that was so prominent in her memories. This cliff held the faces of all the Hokage, forever immortalizing them in the history of the world. Her memories do not give this majestic place enough credit. Hashirama certainly had incredible vision in choosing the village location. Natsum, what did you find? Ah, what a fantastic view. Sahiro stood next to her and enjoyed the sights for a moment. He then made an aha face and took out the map. He looked at it and the surroundings repeatedly before pointing toward a grouping of trees. The Naka Shrine should be right there. This cliff is one of the landmarks. Natsum raised her brow and looked over. It was in clear sight from the cliffside. No way, it wasn't Hashirama? Did Madara suggest the area around the Naka Shrine to build Kanaha? Her memories didn't contain information like that, but based on her understanding, there would be no other reason for Kanaha to be built on top of the Uchiha sacred shrine unless Madara revealed this place to Hashirama. It was possible that he discovered this place on his own, but this is so deep into the forest she doubted the coincidence. 1. After observing for a while, she turned around and started the trek down the side of the mountain. Seeing the location of Kanaha before it is built was a very unique experience for Natsum. She even had some dreams of grandeur. Being one of the faces on the Hokage Rock was very tempting. However, she didn't know if she could beat the charismatic Hashirama. Her understanding of Madara had changed at that moment of realization. 
He was fully invested in the idea of a unified village and probably put everything on the table in order to achieve success. But, in the end, he lost the popularity contest. If it were Natsum in his position, she would likely feel betrayed and disrespected. Thinking about it, the main issue is that the majority of clans forming Kanaha were already on good terms with the Senju. In many cases, having partnership through marriage, it wasn't due to a lack of trying, but rather, there were very few clans allied with the Uchiha to begin with. This was part of their pride as Uchiha blocking themselves from success, in Natsum's opinion. If they had more allies the founding of the village wouldn't have been so unfair. Also, if the people had full understanding of everything that Madara did for them, perhaps they wouldn't have feared him so much. Unfortunately, the personality of an Uchiha is very stubborn and he probably would have hidden his deeds from the public. Sigh. Natsum shook her head and cleared her thoughts. She would just end up in an endless spiral of ifs at that rate. This was all an issue for the future. She wasn't even strong enough to participate in the kind of battles those two had. Also, everything was in the base assumption that she would survive to see them grow up and build Kanaha. The last battle was a good example of her mortality. They eventually made it to the thick section of trees. Sahiro looked on ahead and confirmed it was the correct location. Then, he took out a piece of paper with a Funjutsu formula on it. When he placed it on the ground, the trees seemed to animate as they moved out of the way, creating a path to the center of the thick woods. Let's go. The snow wasn't able to penetrate through the natural Funjutsu barrier that was set up here, so the ground was lush and green. Once they entered the main shrine grounds, dozens of braziers lit up as if welcoming them. They walked up to the wooden platform and knelt down to pay their respects. After kowtowing to their ancestors, Natsum and Sahiro removed all their weapons and placed them in a box outside the shrine. The interior of the shrine was very spacious and did not contain any furniture. A standing stone sat enshrined as the focal point of the building. The two of them went over and knelt in front of the stone. Using their sherry non, they were able to read the history of the clan as told by their ancestors. It was the known history told to all young Uchiha, so it was nothing new. However, reading it directly from the source was quite unique. Tajimasama told me that it was underneath the seventh tatami mat. Sahiro looked over to the mat in question as he talked. After they finished respecting the Uchiha's history, they removed the mat to reveal a solid stone floor. Sahiro made a hand sign to release the seal and moved the stone to the side. Underneath was a hidden staircase. Natsum went down first, but Sahiro placed a hand on her shoulder. No matter what is down there, know that I will always put you first. She frowned and thought to herself, that's exactly what I'm afraid of. 7. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter, 2 unique reviews plus 1 chap. Top 10 power stones, plus 1 chap. Top 3 power stones, plus 1 chap. First rated in power stones, 1 slash day while first base rate. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. So the idea that Madara chose the location for the village may not really be canon. I couldn't find anything specific that said who decided where the village would be, but I always doubted one fact. Why is the Naka shrine in the village? Did they just move their ancestral shrine? No way the Uchiha of all clans would do that. Therefore, the only thing that made sense was that Kanaha was built with Madara's suggestion. Chapter 36, Stone Tablet. The stairs continued down for a short distance before opening out into a similar room as above. At the end of the room was the main shrine of the Uchiha. The slightly weathered stone with rough edges rested on a wooden platform with two braziers constantly burning. As part of the ritual, Natsum and Sahiro took a jar of oil from a compartment in the wall to refill the braziers. Then, they knelt in front of the stones and began to read the text. Just like her memories confirmed, the stone was made in a special way that hides layers of information based on the dojutsu used to view it. She first read it without sharing on, and the information was a simple recount of their ancestor, the first Uchiha. He never met his father, but everything he had was inherited from him since his mother was not very powerful. Natsum understood this to be referring to Indra. The founder of the Uchiha was born in this shrine, which was personally built for his mother and him by his father. He notes how this stone has been here all along. He was always more powerful than his peers, so many gravitated toward him for protection. Eventually, he had a large following which he eventually named the Uchiha clan. The iconic red paper fan became their symbol because of the powerful fire release jutsu he had mastered. At first, only his direct descendants could awaken the Sherinan, so it had not become a symbol of the clan right away. It was not until several generations of the bloodline passed to the descendants of his followers that everyone had a chance to awaken the Sherinan. The story was enlightening, and she pondered it for a moment. There was not much useful information, but she understood why this account was so important. It basically recorded the beginning of the Uchiha. After activating her Sherinan, the text changed to the second layer. After reading it, Natsum felt that whoever wrote this was trying to warn someone. Perhaps this was written by Indra to warn his descendants about misuse of their power. His words were very vague and seemed to just be giving blanket warnings about the Sherinan and the curse of his bloodline. However, Natsum interpreted it differently. She felt that Indra was trying to imply the evolution of the Sherinan was dangerous. This part was clear and any Uchiha could figure it out. However, the key was the evolution beyond the Mangekyo. She knew of the existence of the Rinnegan following after the Sherinan. It seemed that Indra was trying to allude to a higher dojutsu and to never strive to achieve it, for it would be the downfall of the Shinobi world. 2. Finally, she activated her Mangekyo and the next layer was packed with information. It contained the detailed account from Indra speaking of his father. In this account he mentioned the power of creation that his father used to save the world, and how he had inherited this power as a dojutsu. He describes how he was able to rewrite reality or lock people's consciousness in an illusory realm to atone for their sins. Of course, the scale of his ability was beyond the current Izanagi and Izanami of the Uchiha. Additionally, his words implied that he could use it without blindness, however it greatly weakened him. He also talked about manifesting his spiritual form with yin release. In order to develop the ability, he manifested it as a spiritual clone and sent it to the spiritual realm to grow from the endless yin chakra. Once it grew enough to be considered an independent existence, he called it Suzano. This account included his travels around the ninja world and recorded various abilities that Indra possessed including Amaterasu and Tsukuyomi. After the travel log was finished, a new account began by a descendant of the Uchiha founder. 
He discussed the problem of the Mangeku Sherinan and even discovered the solution. He feared that the future Uchiha would destroy themselves if he revealed the solution, but ultimately decided to state it. Only when one grants light to their closest blood kin, will the light become eternal. She looked over at her father and noticed that he was still reading the normal text. Natsum realized that her prior knowledge allowed her to accept the information a lot quicker and jump ahead without taking time to comprehend the words. She continued reading Indra's travel logs to see if she could possibly learn anything new or gain insights into the Sherinan. Although she didn't know what text was hidden beyond this layer, she had an idea of what the Rinnegan layer said. Based on Madara's experience from her inherited memories, the text must have bolstered his pride and talked about true peace existing with the infinite Tsukuyomi. The emotional turmoil that he experienced from losing his brother and being betrayed by the clan must have made him believe anything was better than the current world. This was his most vulnerable moment, and there was this beacon of hope laid out in front of him. What? How can this be? Sahiro finally read the last line of the third layer and looked over at Natsum. She had long finished reading and was just sifting through her thoughts. When she turned to look at him, and he saw her Mangeku eyes, he pondered what she had said before. Did you already know? 1. Natsum planned to lie but when she saw his face, the words choked up. She could only close her eyes and nod. Sahiro laughed at himself and turned back to look at the stone. Tajima would often call the clan cursed whenever things went wrong, but Sahiro never really believed it. Now, he truly understood what it meant to be a cursed clan. Even their ancestor called them a cursed bloodline. Losing your loved ones to achieve a terrible dojutsu only for it to be as fleeting as their lives. However, the ray of hope for preventing that blindness was even worse than awakening. The Uchiha are indeed cursed. 1. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter? Oh chapters? 1. 2 unique reviews plus 1 chap. Top 10 power stones, plus 1 chap. Top 3 power stones, plus 1 chap. First rated in power stones, 1 slash day while first base rate. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Okay I was a bit hesitant this chapter because some of this stuff is kind of my own guess on what the tablet actually says. Hope it made enough sense. Also did you figure it out by now that the Uchiha are cursed? Laughing face. Chapter 37, Spontaneous Enlightenment. Sahiro started meticulously reading everything again hoping to find another option. Natsum saw that he needed some more time, so she left the shrine and explored the future location of Konoha. Although it didn't quite have the splendor of a fully constructed village, there was a subtle piece to the forest that soothed her. She went to a pile of boulders near the cliff face and used chakra to melt away all the snow. Natsum sat on the boulder and looked out at the future village with her imagination. Various civilians and shinobi living together in peace and harmony. She took a deep breath in, and the cold air cleared her mind. Before she knew it, she had entered a state of meditation. A tiny snake peeked its head out from her clothes and leaped onto the ground. It turned into a splatter of ink and a summoning formula appeared on the ground. A woman wearing a shrine uniform and hair neatly tied up appeared. She looked at Natsum who had entered a state of enlightenment. She smirked and took one of her sharp nails to Natsum's neck. A small cut was made but Natsum didn't seem to feel it. Quickly the cut turned purple as the venom entered her body. However, instead of harming her, it seemed to send her deeper into meditation. Pff, she didn't bother staying any longer and reverse summoned herself. All of this was unknown to Natsum. Her consciousness melded into her surroundings and she seemed to sense the existence of something beyond chakra. However, every time she got close to grasping it, it would slip away. Although it got away, she felt like each consecutive failure got her closer and closer to it. After an unknown amount of time, she was awoken by Sahiro shaking her violently and calling out her name. She was lying in a makeshift hut, sweating from head to toe. Her body was chilled from the cold weather. However, she didn't feel uncomfortable at all. You're finally awake. He heaved a sigh of relief seeing her open her eyes. She tried to speak but couldn't move her lips. How long has this poison been bothering you? Was it that Shirogane clan? The anger in his eyes was visible. However, Natsum wasn't sure if that was all he was angry about. She wondered why the poison would flare up again after she had seemingly removed it all. Perhaps there was a hidden danger in her body, and when she entered that strange state, it flared up. 2. Since she couldn't move or respond, Sahiro fed and watered her for a day before the poison was completely eliminated. Natsum thought she had only been meditating for a few hours until Sahiro mentioned that she was unconscious for three days. However, upon inspecting her body she didn't notice any permanent damage. If anything, she felt like her chakra pathways were even smoother than before. There was even an increase in her chakra capacity. 1. Are you sure you are alright? Sahiro asked her once more. Yes, it seems whatever that poison was didn't have the ability to kill. Perhaps it was just to paralyze me. Now that it's gone, I feel much stronger. She gripped her hand in a fist as she said that. We should return. There is nothing left here to see. Tajima sent a message yesterday ordering us to return to the clan. It seems this was his original intention. With our eyes, it is safer to keep us away from the front until we are needed. He has instructed the clan to give us full access to the scroll archives. Apparently, it is tradition that those with Mangeku are sharing on to master all Uchiha knowledge. Natsum thought about it for a moment and nodded. It made sense. This would give her a chance to consolidate her strength and interact with baby Madara. The war wasn't going anywhere, and her mobility could be considered the highest in the current shinobi world. It would take at least a decade before Senja Tobirame invented the flying rage in Jetsu. Her memories weren't clear on the exact time he created the Jetsu only that he first revealed it in the final battle between him and Aizuna. 1. Thinking of Tobirame, Natsum sighed. If he were the one with the memories, he could probably reverse engineer every Jetsu just from seeing it. However, Natsum's ability was severely lacking in this craft. She wondered if after peace was attained, she could confide in him these various Jutsu and rely on him to develop the village beyond the original from her memories. Although he is the bane of Uchiha, his policies and ideologies were commendable. 3. Perhaps if she could prevent the hate from forming in Madara's heart, and prevent Aizuna from dying, there could be true peace between the two clans. Without that hatred, he wouldn't push the clan to betraying him, and then wouldn't scheme to later destroy the clan, the village, and the shinobi world. She cut off the train of thoughts and focused on the present. There was still quite a lot to get through before that was even possible. There was also the possibility that her existence had already caused the future to change. However, all changes would be dust under her foot if she was the strongest. This was the most obvious way to ensure all of her plans succeeded. Schemes and traps were useless under absolute strength. If she can't change the Uchiha's dismal future, she just wasn't strong enough. 
Natsum thought once more about that strange energy she felt while meditating. She didn't quite understand it, but her instincts told her that it was very powerful. Whenever she got close to capturing it, she could feel the overwhelming strength behind it. It was a type of strength that could ruin her if she couldn't control it, but would be her strongest tool if she could. Could it be? Nature energy. The thought suddenly occurred to her. Being able to sense nature energy without the assistance of the animal sages was something only reserved for geniuses like Hashirama, so she didn't think of it right away. However, the sensation she experienced couldn't be explained any other way. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter, oh chapters, one. Two unique reviews plus one chap. Top ten power stones, plus one chap. Top three power stones, plus one chap. First rated in power stones, one slash day while first face rate. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Is it weird that when I'm off I don't write but when I have work I do? I always feel the most creative when I'm being stressed out by work. Enjoy the chapter. Chapter 38, New Knowledge 1. Natsum returned to the boulder to try and experience that sensation again. After another day of waiting, she gave up. It seemed that the special state she entered had already passed. She could only be patient when it came to nature energy, since there were many risks involved in the process. A slight slip-up could turn her into a stone statue. When Natsum was done, Sahiro didn't say anything. She had asked to stay behind in order to check something, so he waited for her. They had plenty of rations to last them and since they were returning to the clan there was no rush. The two of them quickly packed their camp and headed toward the clan. It would take them another two days to return, so Natsum meditated every chance she had to try to sense nature energy again. Consecutive failures didn't discourage her. Since she could do it once, naturally she could do it again. It must be a lack of opportunity and time. They finally returned to the clan and Natsum realized she felt a bit homesick. Although they were only gone for a few weeks, it was the first time she spent so long outside the clan complex. When she arrived, the sound of children playing and adults talking filled her ears. The silence a shinobi experienced could be the most deafening of all. Natsum bid Sahiro farewell and returned to her room first to rest. When she dropped off her packs, she quickly changed clothes and went to see Kono and Madara. Outside their room, she could hear Kono whispering words to the baby Madara. One day you will be the strongest Uchiha and lead everyone to live peacefully. She continued encouraging him and Natsum had a weird expression. These kinds of things were enough to inflate the child's ego as he grew up. She wondered if perhaps Madara's personality was a bit strange due to his diehard Uchiha fan of a mother. Thinking about it, Kono would always say things that emphasized how Uchiha were superior to everyone else. Ah, Natsum you're back. After knocking on the door and not getting a response, she entered in and watched the brainwashing occur real time. After a while, Kono finally noticed here there. As soon as she was discovered, Kono went over and hugged her. I missed you. The two of them sat down together and Natsum started talking about the last few weeks without sharing too many specific details. The ancestral grounds are really pretty, I hope to show you one day. Natsum said offhandedly. She didn't know why there was no memory of Madara's mother, except that her death must have been expected. The future duo seemed to like comparing trauma, but Madara never mentioned his mother to Hashirama. I would like to go. When Madara is older, you can take us together. Kono was always optimistic and never focused on things like war or survival. She just wished to explore what the world had to offer. Unfortunately, she was born in the wrong era. How long will you be back? Most likely until the snow melts. Ah, will you be busy until then? Kono seemed to understand the pattern. Her father and Tajima must have had the same pattern. Natsum thought about it and felt that visiting the mother and son duo wouldn't interfere with her activities and shook her head. Kono's eyes lit up and she grabbed Natsum's hands in excitement. That's great. Madara will love it. Natsum spent the rest of the day with Kono and Madara. They played together, and Natsum attempted to knit and discovered that she had a bit of talent. Although, she did cheat a little and use Sherry Non to Kono's displeasure. Everything Kono had made so far was not what she wanted and ended up being gifted to another clansman. 1. The next day, Natsum went out to the archives first thing in the morning. Sahiro had also come at the same time and the two greeted each other before entering. The Uchiha that was temporarily in charge already received word ahead and time and took them to the loot room first. The pair of Funjutsu sealed doors opened and Natsum was assaulted by the scent of scrolls and books. It was a very nostalgic scent. She spent a few hours sorting through the most useful information and ended up finding a few sources of Funjutsu. Most of the knowledge contained in the books was intended for practical scroll seals like storage scrolls, but it would greatly enhance her combat capabilities and give her a foundation to adapt the four symbol seal. She had been given permission to take the knowledge with her and return to her home. She promised she would spend time with Kono and Madara so she was thankful to Tajima letting her leave the library with the original copies. With three large scrolls in her hands she left the archive and headed back. Families were very active during the winter since they were the safest months. This usually meant that all the kids were let loose, which allowed them to gather together to play. Any san Several kids called out to her as she was walking back. They didn't know her specifically, since they were four or five years younger than her. They saw by the sword strapped to her waist that she was a shinobi, and by her age they felt she was more approachable. Natsum saw the kids and remembered when she was their age. It wasn't very long ago, but it felt like a lifetime. Yes, she was very kind and smiled to the kids. One of the more nervous ones in the group smiled and puffed up his chest. See, I told you Eni-san was nice. Eni, Eni, can you teach us how to use chakra? I want to fight like Eni-san. The kids spoke all at the same time but she just smiled and rubbed the head of the main kid that approached her. She tapped her lips as if pondering the answer which made all the kids shake in anticipation. All right, I can show you, but it's not easy. We can do it. Show us, show us. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter, oh chapters, two. Two unique reviews plus one chap. Top ten power stones, plus one chap. Top three power stones, plus one chap. First rated in power stones, one slash day while first base rate. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Sorry I had a busy few days, I didn't forget about y'all. Any artists out there? Chapter 39, Funjutsu Practice. Natsum smiled and spent some time showing the kids how to mold and circulate chakra. 
Only two of them had already built up a little chakra but had no idea how to push it through their tenkitsu. Ultimately, none of them were successful in their endeavors but they had determination and excitement in their eyes. Their parents and neighbors would always talk about how much pride the Uchiha had in their warriors and so they naturally wanted to be included in that. After spending a few hours teaching them, the kids were called back by their mothers and the group was disbanded. Natsum returned home with a slight smile on her face. She had never taught anyone before, and although the kids weren't able to succeed, they put all their energy into it and asked a lot of questions. She felt very satisfied and wondered if she should take on some students after the next mission. 1. Natsum, quick come look at Madara. Natsum was just outside her room when Kono called out to her from next door. She was worried something happened and flickered the rest of the way. The gust of wind startled Kono and she pointed at Madara on the bed. What's wrong? Kono picked Madara up and placed him on his back. After a few seconds of orienting himself, he turned himself over on all fours. Madara is so smart, he can already turn over on his own. Kono gleefully clapped and looked over at Natsum with a proud expression. Natsum had mixed feelings. She made it sound urgent, but it was just her showing off Madara's growth. Natsum put her hand to her forehead and rubbed her brows. Then she had a thought. Kono-chan, what do you think of me teaching Madara when he's a little older? Kono, who was still turning Madara on his back repeatedly to watch him turn over stopped and turned around. Her face was beaming, and she came over to hug Natsum. She squeezed her tightly, but it wasn't uncomfortable. Yes, I would love it. And when he grows up, the two of you can even mar Natsum's eyes widened, and she cut Kono off. 3. Of course, Madara will be a great shinobi when he grows up. Kono rolled her eyes and had her own thoughts. After playing with Madara for a bit, Natsum took the scrolls and began studying them in the corner of the room. She would occasionally look up to watch the duo playing around. Madara's laughs and cries intermittently filled the room. Fortunately, with the sharing on Natsum was able to easily focus on reading. It took her the rest of the day to read all of the Funjutsu scrolls she brought with her and decided to take a break. HNNG. Natsum got up from the mat and stretched her back. Madara raised his arms up and giggled at her as if trying to copy her. Natsum thought it was really cute, so she went over to him and placed him on her lap. Madara played with her hair that had grown quite long. Fortunately his grip wasn't very strong yet, so he ended up just patting it. Kono was asleep at the side, so Natsum took Madara to his bed and wrapped him tightly. Once his head was down, he started dozing off. For a baby, his life was perfect. He got to play with his mom and big sister, he was fed several times a day, and everything else was taken care for him. Natsum sighed thinking about the weight on this little baby's shoulders. He doesn't realize what is waiting for him when he grows up. She slowly caressed his little head and whispered to him, You'll be great. Natsum finished cleaning up and went to her room. The next few days passed by the same. Natsum would do her morning training, play with the local kids, play with Kono and Madara, and study the Funjutsu scrolls. Although she memorized all the information, he still had to take the time to comprehend the information. The main issue with completed Jutsu is that it did not contain the theory behind its formation. Therefore, Natsum was essentially taking apart and reconstructing the various Funjutsu. Her first attempt at making a storage scroll ended in failure. However, Natsum learned a valuable lesson, do not experiment with incomplete Funjutsu indoors. After nearly destroying her room, she moved to her little courtyard that she shared with Kono. Since the weather was nice, Kono and Madara sat outside and watched her. Natsum had a large, blank scroll completely rolled out all over the courtyard. She started at one end with a brush. The seals in Funjutsu weren't made of ink although they looked like it. It was actually a simple kind of yin release jutsu that contained a dense amount of Funjutsu formulas which would appear dark like ink. If they used actual ink, then ink producers would be economic powerhouses. And with how frequently shinobi used storage scrolls, they could rule the shinobi world. 1. After three hours of consecutive writing, the whole scroll was filled with countless formulas. She sighed and laid down on the ground to rest before checking her work. The sky was clear and the temperature was slowly rising every day. Before long, she would be called to the front again to fight. The peace she experienced now was temporary. After staring at the blue sky for a while, she sat up again and went back through the scroll from the beginning. Okay, everything looks right. She pressed her hand on the end of the scroll and inserted chakra. The formula and scroll rolled up on their own as the funjutsu curled up into a series of densely packed lines. Once the scroll rolled up all the way to only leaving a small pattern, Natsum sighed in relief. Success. Natsum did a little fist pump to celebrate. She was in awe of the first people to discover the formula for sealing scrolls and implementing it. Shinobi only needed to memorize the shortcut to reproduce the scroll, no one took the time to write out the whole scroll from scratch anymore. However, by doing so, Natsum successfully increased her funjutsu proficiency. 1. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter, oat chapters, 3. 2 unique reviews plus 1 chap. Top 10 power stones, plus 1 chap. Top 3 power stones, plus 1 chap. First rated in power stones, 1 slash day while first base rate. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. OMG I'm so sorry the days are running together TT don't leave me PLS I love you. Chapter 40, there and back. Natsum took a shuriken and placed it on the ceiling pattern. After inserting chakra, the shuriken vanished with a puff. It also returned without issue when she activated the scroll once more. This was the simplest form of storage scroll that existed in the world. The function was to store a set quantity of objects in an independent space. The quantity was limited to how the scroll was written. The more objects you wanted to store, the more costly it was for the user to place or release the seal. Simply put, someone with low chakra reserves couldn't have scrolls filled with thousands of weapons. It took precise chakra control and funjutsu knowledge since the base formula was optimized for efficiency. That efficiency started to rapidly fall off the higher you went in storage capacity, so a new formula would be needed eventually. This was Natsum's next step. Adapting and innovating funjutsu was very complicated and took a lot of time. 2. Every day consisted of training, teaching, playing, and experimenting. A week of trial and error left Natsum a bit disappointed. She decided to step away from funjutsu and gather some ninjutsu knowledge. Her jutsu repertoire was a bit lacking for someone that wished to compete with the powerhouses in the future. The only issue was that the archives contained hundreds of jutsu scrolls. After sifting through the low to high rank jutsu for a day, Natsum realized a startling fact. They were practically useless to the Uchiha, 
Most of the jutsu here were looted from the enemy, and the ones that were made by Uchiha were either incomplete, or just an altered version of an already existing jutsu. The ones looted did hold some research value, but there were very few fire and earth release jutsu among them. Therefore, after a day of skimming hundreds of scrolls, Natsum only found a few that were beneficial to her. She decided to move on to the top-ranked jutsu once she had finished memorizing and mastering the ones she picked out. There were many core Uchiha fire techniques as well as some foreign fire and earth release techniques that were not cost-effective but she decided to learn anyway for overall mastery. Like that, time passed, and it was already early February. Natsum's days were simple and peaceful. However, the days were getting warmer, and the peace was just the calm before the storm. It's been almost a week since it last snowed, and the ground is already clear. Kono said to Natsum as she stared at the clear sky. There was a bird high in the sky heading her way. And, it looks like winter is ending. Natsum replied, her eyes still tracking the lone bird in the sky. Madara woke up at that moment and was reaching out for Natsum. She gave him a sidelong glacé and smiled. Once she took him in her arms, he started giggling. The bird finally descended and landed on a nearby branch. She took the message tied to its leg and read the short note. It's time. 1. Kono knew what the note was without seeing it and went to retrieve Madara. He was clingy and didn't want to let go, but ultimately, he couldn't overpower the adults. Say goodbye to your NE-san, Madara-kun. She tried to play with him to calm him down but he seemed to have a sixth sense that something was happening. He started crying. At first his sounds were the usual, but he figured out how to form a word for the first time. Nene. Natsum's heart melted when she heard that. She never expected the three-month-old Madara to say his first words, let alone them to be calling for her. She squeezed his nose lightly and kissed his chubby arm. Two. I'll be back soon, Madara. When I come back, I'll teach you lots of things. Two. Natsum returned to her room and grabbed her gear. She wore the standard dark gray cloak without chest armor. The armor was too bulky to be used for a mission that prioritized speed and stealth. Although she hadn't fully mastered the new jutsu she had been studying, they were enough to be used and may even be very helpful in certain situations. On the way out, she ran into Sahiro. He was dressed identically to her and they simply nodded toward each other and made their way to the headquarters on the border of the Land of Fire. They couldn't move at full speed since they still had to be careful with having their movements revealed to the enemy. It was uncertain to what extent the Fire Daimyo went to trick his competitors. After a week of carefully traveling through the Land of Fire and taking many detours, they arrived at the headquarters. Tajimadano, Natsum-sama, and Sahiro-sama have arrived. One of the Uchiha guards came to Tajima's tent and roused him awake. It was the middle of the night when the two arrived. He left his tent and met them outside. 6. I hope you gained a lot of knowledge. You will definitely need it. He had a solemn and tired look on his face. It went beyond just the tiredness of a few sleepless nights. We returned from scouting not too long ago. There are five clans set up in the land of rice fields with a secure perimeter. Although the overall number of shinobi is lower than us, if any of them send out a message we will be flanked from all sides. Natsum frowned at his words. This was the worst case scenario. It seems that they predicted something like this would happen. Given the circumstances, their best method of attack would be launching guerrilla warfare and blocking supply routes. If they could prevent messages from leaking it would be ideal, but if not, then intercepting the reinforcements en route would be the best move. Natsum, you seem to have an idea. Tajima had been paying close attention to Natsum and whenever she was thinking she would make the same expression. I do have some thoughts, Tajima-sama. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Sorry guys I was in the hospital. I'm okay now. I'll try to catch up ASAP. Thanks for sticking around 3. Chapter 41, Infiltration. Warfare wasn't Natsum's specialty, however, her inherited memories contained historical knowledge of wars. Although they didn't include specific details or the logic behind some battles, Natsum could use her own understandings along with the experienced Achiha's experience to refine a strategy. After hearing all of her thoughts about the situation, Tajima rubbed his chin and pondered. Did you study warfare while you were in the archives? He mused. However, Natsum shook her head which caused him to nearly break character. The Senju clan leader is very fixated on honor and would not expect these tactics of attacking and retreating while blocking their supplies. After the first attack, he would likely mobilize his full strength each time to intercept us. Another advantage to this style of underhanded warfare was the reduction of casualties on their side. The large-scale all-out battles only proved to cause more deaths for both sides for no apparent gain. It became a battle of attrition instead of tactics. Natsum felt this was a waste and still held firm in her desire to protect the clan in any way possible, even if it were introducing controversial tactics. Although, it wasn't that no one ever did such things in history, but most clans considered such things below their pride. There was not a lot of time to rest since Natsum and Sahiro arriving was the last thing they were waiting on. Now that everyone was here, Tajima called for the camp to mobilize in the morning. In order to take away their vulnerability of having a central camp, they would all work in small cells and constantly move. This would prevent the enemies from discovering their camp and retaliating. Everyone was grouped in fours except for Natsum. Tajima had told her to stay behind as he had a different task for her. The units of four would begin by scattering through the land and taking out any isolated shinobi. Once the last group left the camp, Tajima sat alone in his tent with Natsum across from him. He was finishing off the last pot of tea before packing up. I have a task for you. Tajima finished sipping tea and turned to her. Yes, Tajima-sama. During the time you were away, I have been thinking about your abilities. I am sure you yourself have already figured out the potential and application of such power. In a war, there are many ways to win. One of the most successful ways is by taking out the leader. He paused and sipped his tea. Natsum bit her lip unconsciously and nodded. She was well aware of how powerful her Fukukoma and Zenkaizen were for assassinations. However, being overly reliant on her Manjikyu Sherinan would be her downfall. The loyalty to the Uchiha she had deep within her bones wouldn't let her disobey the clan leader, but her ambitions were beyond a scope that he could fathom. Actually, I didn't want to suggest this, so that you had room to grow first. However, the situation has changed. All of our attempts at scouting deeper into the territory to identify the exact location of the mine have not been fruitful. The risks involved in sending someone in were too high, so remote scouting was all we could manage. Therefore, your mission is to infiltrate the land of rice fields and discover the location of the mine and incapacitate or kill the leaders. Natsum nodded her head. The situation was simple. Although anyone could have been sent in to do this mission, Natsum was the only one that had a cheat-like ability to escape unscathed. 
Tajima wasn't even aware of the full scope of her Zenkai's inability. If he knew, he might just push her to use it to look around. She would definitely not waste her prowess like that. So going undercover was the most practical route. Tajima had already prepared plain gray robes used by the rice farmers. They were worn out and even had a cute little duck embroidered on the hem. Transformation Jutsu was the easiest way to disguise oneself, but it had many flaws. The average shinobi couldn't tell if someone was transformed, but since all attempts at scouting were stifled by the opponent, Tajima guessed they had powerful sensors on their side. Therefore, physical disguise was the best choice. Fortunately, the people of the land of rice fields shared similar traits to the land of fire so it would be easy to mingle in as a refugee. In the land of rice fields, you only needed to know how to work the farms. Your origin or status were secondary to how much you harvest. In that sense, the land of rice fields daimyo was very profit driven. She made a few finishing touches to improve her disguise and sealed away all of her equipment in a scroll of her own design. She hid the scroll in her robes and frowned again at the inconvenience of not having a summoner's contract. Although she established one with Tejitsuim, she had specified not to summon her unless necessary. Using her as a beast of burden may anger her. All right, looks good. Natsum nodded at her reflection in the water and started walking to the border of the land of fire and land of rice fields. Although she could move quicker, her intention was to accumulate some travel wear on her clothes and body. A pristine poor farming child would be suspicious. Like this, she traveled during the daylight hours, and slept in the forest during the night. On the third day, she was fetching water at a river when a group encountered her. Oh dear, look at that poor child. What is your name? One of the women in the group called out to her from the party. Natsum feigned fear and tried to run away across the river, but fell on the slippery rocks and started getting pulled by the current. Oh no, Lee, save her. She called out to her companion and he threw off his outer robe and dived in to rescue the drowning Natsum. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Time for some slice of life farming? I'm feeling a lot better today, but I still can't quite get around without getting tired. Being in a hospital bed for so long sucks. Thank you for sticking around 3 I have a treat for you guys in a few days, winky face. Chapter 42, New Family. Natsum pretended to drown like she saw from the moving pictures in her memories. Once the man safely secured her, she applied chakra to one of her pressure points to knock herself out. Seeing that she was unconscious, the man was more frantic to bring her ashore. Once she made it to shore, the woman came over and checked on her. Seeing the soaked robes she called for her to be brought to the covered cart. Natsum woke up some time later and felt that her clothes were a bit loose for her. The first thing she did was pretend to panic. Seeing this, the woman next to her patted her chest and soothed her with soft words. It's okay, you almost drowned. Your clothes were soaked so you're wearing a spare robe. And no my clothes. Natsum seemed to have difficulty with her words, but the woman seemed to understand. They seem very important to you? Don't worry, they are just drying in the sun. Did your mother make it for you? She smiled at the girl, but Natsum gave a sad smile before nodded lightly. She was on the verge of tears which made the woman realize the situation. I, lost my daughter. She would be around your age now, if you are willing to come back with us. Natsum could tell the woman had a lot of pain in her as well and seeing the nearly drowned Natsum plucked at her heartstrings. After learning she was an orphan, she immediately jumped at the chance to adopt. Natsum didn't want to see overly zealous, so she bit her lip and looked away. Ah, you don't have to decide now, but let me help dry your clothes and give you a meal. She realized her attitude was a bit aggressive and pulled back a little. Natsum nodded lightly and even gave her a smile with her eyes. The car traveled until dark, and a camp was set up. Based on the direction, Natsum could tell it was heading deeper into the land of rice fields. My name is Saya, and this is my husband Lee who rescued you. After they stopped, the woman helped Natsum get off the cart and introduced herself and her husband. There were other people in the caravan, but they didn't seem to want anything to do with her. Lee came over with her robes and the scroll that she had hidden. Natsum wasn't worried about being discovered with the scroll, as all it contained were some final words from her parents. Only a trained shinobi with the right chakra code could decipher the storage scroll. This was another advantage of learning Funjutsu herself. It instructed her to go to the land of rice fields and meet with her uncle's family if they didn't come back alive. Seeing the seal was broken, it seemed that they had read it. Some, I apologize but I read your letter. I hope you understand. Lee was an forthright and honest man. After going through her belongings, he felt guilty once he read the letter. And, I understand Uncle Lee. She looked at her robes, specifically the embroidery on the hem and started to tear up. Seeing this, Saya couldn't resist hugging her to comfort her. Lee seemed to understand his wife's feelings and simply left her stuff to her and went to prepare dinner. Natsum was resting beside the fire and overheard the other families talking. I think we should get rid of her, they increased security at the checkpoint. That's cruel, but I am afraid you might be right. Natsum frowned inwardly. However, Lee stood up for her. We will adopt her and take responsibility. There will be no problems. Ah, I'm sorry Tsum, I know you aren't ready yet. She was explaining but Natsum hugged her robes and nodded towards Saya. Auntie, I'm so glad I found you and uncle. She implied that they were the family she was looking for, and Saya instantly beamed. Oh, my good niece, fate brought us together. I'll take care of you in my sister's stead. She smiled and hugged Natsum. Although she was acting, she could feel the motherly love that was being diverted to her which caused her stomach to turn slightly sour. When Lee walked over with three bowls of meat stew, he looked awkwardly at his wife and daughter. Uncle, thank you. She smiled at him and took the bowl. Lee coughed and nodded. He had a hard time with showing emotions, but Natsum could see it on his face. He loved his wife and was happy to see her happy. We are family now, don't thank me. Natsum couldn't resist laughing in joy. Lee was a bit embarrassed at his mushy words and started eating with his head down. My old man is like this, don't mind him. Ah, your hair is all messed up, would you let auntie brush it for you? She had an expectant look on her face. Natsum nodded slightly and caused her to beam in joy. She had planned to use Genjutsu to guide these two to accept her quicker but didn't expect such a twist of fate. The war left many families without children, so it wasn't strange. In the middle of the night, she went around to the other families and placed them under a Genjutsu so that they wouldn't reveal her to the checkpoint guards. Because she used her Mangekyu Sherry Non for this, only someone of similar Dojutsu strength or highly specialized in Genjutsu could see the manipulation. It was just a simple altering of reality that made her the biological niece of Lee and Saya. Then, she quietly slipped back 
back into the arms of her new aunt and took a chance to rest her eyes. The next day, she changed into her original clothes and noticed the holes were repaired. She looked over at Saya but didn't say anything. She hid the scroll in her clothes again and got on the front of the cart. They were being pulled by a large oxen and Natsum found it fascinating. Soon, they came up to the first checkpoint. Several armed shinobi stopped the caravan in order to search for suspicious people. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. I got my stitches checked today and everything is healing well. Thank you guys for your support. The nurse said that I'll have minimal scarring yay. Chapter 43, Flawless Infiltration. Who is this? She is not on your household register. The guard looked at Lee while reading through his paperwork. Lee looked him in the face and told him directly. She is my brother's daughter. Her parents died and she is coming to live with us. Do you have any proof of this? Lee nodded toward Natsum, and so she took out the scroll from her clothes. The shinobi jumped when she reached into her robes thinking she would bring out a weapon, but relaxed when it was just a scroll. In this era, children were just as dangerous as adults. Fortunately, they didn't detect any chakra from her except for what was needed to sustain life. The man took the scroll and read it carefully. Although the names of her uncle's family weren't mentioned, it was enough to corroborate the story. The shinobi wouldn't make the farmer's lives hard if there was no proof of suspicious activity. However, they interviewed the others in the caravan to double-check just in case. They described the story and supported the Lee family in their claims. Lee and Saya heard this and were surprised. They assumed the others lied to help them and made a note in their heart to treat these neighbors better in the future. Saya hugged Natsum and comforted her. All right, but make sure to update your register immediately so this doesn't happen again. Lee nodded and went back on his cart. The caravan was led through without any problems. When they arrived at the farming town, Natsum's eyes went wide. It was unlike anything she had seen before. The landscape was riddled with rice paddies as far as she could see. Considering her visual prowess, it was very remarkable. This is our little farming community. We are in charge of two fields. Your uncle works hard, and we make quite a bit more than our neighbors, so they are usually jealous of us. You won't suffer here with us, I promise. Natsum felt guilty at these words and didn't hide it. She took the initiative to hug Saya and nod her head in her sleeve. Saya just rubbed her head and hummed a soft tune. Saya came to their little two-room home and started preparing a place for Natsum to sleep. Natsum needed to register, and Lee needed to pay his tax for the recent sale of rice so they both went to the Lord's Mansion. The process was simple, and Lee paid out nearly 10,000 ryo in taxes. Natsum widened her eyes and realized what Saya meant by their income being very good. Since you have a new family member, take back this bit. The Lord congratulates you on reuniting with family. The kind receptionist handed him back a thousand ryo and smiled at Natsum. Lee was thankful and tipped her two hundred. She was used to his generosity and took it willingly. The rest was handed to Natsum. Uncle, she was going to give it back, but his expression was stubborn. She decided to spend the money on gifts for the two. Although she was only here temporarily, her soft heart was already won over by the sincere family. It made her think of the future hidden villages and new shinobi system was even more expectation. Different people could live together peacefully if they willed it. This was proof of love in the world. On the way back, a farmer was selling fresh fruit on the roadside. Natsum patted Lee's hands to stop the cart and jumped down. She went to the old man and took out the 800 ryo. Uncle, how much per apple? Ah, 10 ryo for a dozen. He said smiling at the cute girl in front of him. Saya had done her hair up in pigtails which made her look very cute. She also had two plain ribbons in her hair. Natsum didn't get a chance to see her reflection, so she didn't even realize how her demeanor had changed from that slight modification. Uncle, that's too little, here's 20. She handed him the money and grabbed one of the sacks that looked the best. He chuckled and resisted the urge to rub her head. He saw she was with Lee and made note of it. She ran back and jumped onto the cart. Lee tried to help her up but underestimate her physique. Seeing his expression, Natsum put her fist up and smiled. Uncle, I'm actually pretty strong. I was just tired and hungry before. He didn't say anything but simply grunted. Since he gave her the money, he wouldn't criticize her for how she spent it, but inwardly he was happy with the way she did business. She seemed to be a very clever girl and had a feeling his life would be nicer in the future. Uncle, is there anyone selling fabric in town? She asked shyly. He seemed to understand her intention and looked up at the sun, quickly calculating the time. The open market should still be running. We can make a quick detour. The market was bustling at this hour, since many families just returned from exporting their excess crop for money. A family couldn't live on rice alone, and the local lord would only accept so much rice annually. Therefore, any extra crop was left to the family to deal with. Since he was here, he decided to buy some essentials. Natsum immediately entered the crowd and was like a fish in the water. Memories surfaced of night markets in a grander scale than this. She felt a comforting sensation being in a place like this and quickly spent all the remaining money she had on fabric. She was only able to get one bolt of cloth with her remaining funds, but the seller added in a spool of thread for free. Natsum returned to Lee's cart and saw that he was already waiting with a large bag of various vegetables and some meat tied up with twine. When she climbed up to the cart, he helped her put away the bolt of cloth. They were shopping for an hour at most, so when they returned, the little home was already transformed. The bedroom had an extra bed, and there was another mat at the table. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. I'm writing these on my phone because I'm staying with my parents without my computer for a few days. Point out any grammar or spelling errors I'm sure there's plenty lol. Chapter 44. Encounter nature energy again. Sum, did you enjoy the market? She saw the goods on the cart and the excited look on her face. Natsum ran up to Saya and hugged her. Saya was surprised but hugged her back. Natsum was in the middle of acting, but deep down she had the urge to treat Saya as her mother. This was a trauma she couldn't seem to get over. The trauma was clear and Saya didn't find it strange at all. Honey, welcome home. She looked over at Lee as he unloaded the cart and started taking care of the ox. Lee nodded at her and looked away. Saya giggled at her shy husband and brought Natsum into the house to show her around. There wasn't much, which was expected of a farming family. Natsum realized just how wealthy of a life she had in her clan. She hoped that more families could share that comfortable life in the future. 1. And, let me help you make rice. 
Natsum rolled up her sleeves and started helping Saya wash the rice and vegetables. She smiled and didn't say no. The best way to build a rapport was to do things together and both of them had that intention. Saya was determined to give her motherly love to fill in the void and Natsum was trying to build her identity flawlessly. After three days of living with her adoptive family, Natsum planned her first nightly mission. Saya and Lee would be traveling to a nearby village and not return until the next day. They needed to buy some specialized rice seedlings to sow for the new season. This was his secret to high yield every year. Saya gave Natsum a long list of things to do and how to take care of herself. We left plenty of money, don't hesitate to buy whatever you need. Lee sat on the cart waiting to leave, but Saya was nervously repeating everything to Natsum again. And, I understand. Remember to go to bed on time and lock up. Don't let the rodents get into the pantry. Ask the neighbor if you need any help with anything. I understand. Natsum was patient. She never experienced such smothering love before and didn't get frustrated. However, she was finally rescued by Lee as he picked Saya up and placed her on the cart. We'll be right back. I'll miss you. I'll miss you too. Natsum waved at them until they were too far to see. After they left, Natsum shut the door and sat on the mat. There was something different about this place that gave her a sense of serenity. Not using her chakra for the last few days gave her a peace she never attained in the clan. She started molding her chakra and entered a meditative state. Before long, she was already in a trance. The sensation she experienced at the Naka Shrine had returned. Her perception was at an all-time high and what she suspected to be nature energy was right before her. She reached out to it and nearly grasped a strand. However, unlike before, she was patient. She waited for the energy to return to her rather than chasing after it. Every time she repeated the process, it would get closer and closer to her. When she just barely touched it, the sensation disappeared. Natsum wasn't discouraged because this was great progress. She opened her eyes, and it was already midnight. She realized that she depleted all of her chakra while sensing nature energy. However, the next time she attempted to gather nature energy she was confident in succeeding. Next time I will reach out to Tejitsuim to help me. I do not wish to be turned to stone. The side effects were scary, but the benefits were worth it. She took out the storage scroll and released the hidden Funjutsu seal. After retrieving her equipment, she disappeared into the night with a yin release technique that made her like a shadow in the night. She searched the nearby lands and looked for any signs of shinobi. After six hours, she didn't find anything. Natsum expected this to be a long-term mission, so she wasn't discouraged. She activated Fukukoma and sent an update directly to the coordinates he had given her previously. Using it a few times she already figured out that she could send small objects for practically no cost to her. Then, she packed up her gear and returned to her temporary life. Fortunately, her travel speed was significantly faster than a cart and she made it back before anyone noticed anything. She took a hot bath and cleaned up around the house. She decided to make herself a big breakfast to cover up for not eating anything the last day. In the afternoon, she heard the wagon wheels as the two returned. Sim, we're back. Saya came down and went over to check on Natsum. She checked her all over for any injuries and Natsum just let her be inspected with a smile on her face. Lee was already unloading germinated rice seeds in a small hand cart. He would manually plant them all and then monitor their growth for the next few months. Uncle, let me help you sow the rice seeds. Natsum came to his side and had a very determined expression. He saw her and after a moment consideration he nodded his head. You need boots and different clothes. She smiled and nodded her head. The market was still open so she took some money and ran to the market before Saya could even stop her. However, they had no issue with her helping. Usually, Saya and Lee would do it on their own every year, but most of the work was done by Lee alone. A little helper would be more than welcomed. She's such a good child. And, Lee spoke little, but Saya could understand his feelings. You really like her. Saya looked over at him and he turned away to hide his face, causing Saya to laugh. Equals 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 equals. Nine chapters owed left. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Turns out waiting rooms are great places to just throw down weeks of ideas. Three chapters in two hours I'm kind of amazing. Anyway, hope you aren't too disappointed by the slice of life I promise we will get through it quickly, laughing face. Chapter 45, Trail Discovered. The first day of farming, Natsum turned out to be a natural. Her earth release affinity made her move through the mud like she was an eel. Lee was surprised at her talent but just assumed she had experience farming. It wasn't rare for kids to help their parents as soon as they were able. After working for a whole day in the sun, Natsum was only able to plant an eighth of the field. She realized just how big the fields were. It was no wonder that Lee made so much, the yield must be astronomical. Lee had done about twice as much as her, and Saya had just been preparing the seeds for planting. Seeing how diligent Natsum was, the duo was quite satisfied. Saya decided to make a big dinner tonight for the two hard workers. Some neighbors had come by occasionally and saw the speed Natsum was working and were also shocked. It was like finding an ugly duckling only to discover it was actually a golden goose. They enviously left back to their own duties. The family of three was unbothered by these jealous neighbors and continued their day-to-day -day activities. The family environment was always happy and joyful. It gave Natsum an experience she never had before. While she worked the fields, she sensed herself come closer to nature. 2. In her memories, no one had ever been able to master Senjutsu in the Uchiha's history except for the last Indra reincarnation Suzuki. However, his mastery over Senjutsu was more artificially created through experimentation. Based on her experience so far, Natsum wondered if the nature of Uchiha being shinobi by birth prevented them from ever integrating with nature. Since Senjo Hashirama was a wood release user, his proximity to nature was at the peak. It took the family a week to completely plant and flood the rice fields so that they could begin growing. However, the process wasn't finished because weeds and pests would invade the patties that needed to be dealt with daily. Lee was very meticulous in examining each corner of the fields and digging out the eels that grew too big to serve up for dinner. After another few days passed, Natsum had another opportunity to scout the territory. Are you sure you don't need me to come? Saya was nervous, looking at Natsum and Lee. The day before, one of their neighbors had come to them in a panic. All of their seeds had failed to germinate, and the head of the household got sick. They begged Lee for help, and he thought this would be a good opportunity to pay them back for covering for them, so he agreed. Auntie, I want to see the other village? We will be fine. Natsum gave her a bright smile. 
When she moved her head around her long pigtails would dance around cutely. She didn't bother changing her hairstyle since Saya liked it so much except when she was working the field. After some more convincing, they were able to leave together. The journey took the whole day so they would stay the night. Fortunately, Lee was a regular customer and had a place to stay in the village. After four hours of silence, Lee finally spoke up. Some good work. Natsum almost burst out in laughter. He was really bad with his words, but she understood his sincerity. He was really awkward and when someone pointed out his feelings, he got shy. She reached out and patted him on the head. He coughed and turned away. She couldn't hold back her giggling. When she was with this family, Natsum felt like a simple farmer instead of a killing machine. However, she would easily become a demon if it meant preserving her clan. A little bit of killing intent slipped out but she stifled it before it affected Lee. Fortunately, his friend in the next town had an extra room for Natsum to stay in so she had some privacy. Once she closed the door, she took out her gear and quickly slipped into the night. Unfortunately, she still didn't discover anything. However, she noticed another checkpoint going further south and wondered if that was a potential direction to explore. She returned before the sun rose and in the morning helped Lee purchase some more germinated rice seeds. However, they encountered a problem, which turned into an opportunity. I'm sorry Lee, I sold all of my stock already. You'll have to go to the next town. Lee looked over at Natsum and considered it carefully. She looked up at him and gave him a signal. He seemed to understand her gesture and then nodded at the man. It's okay. Thank you. They got back on the cart and continued south. Fortunately, he carried his register with him in case they were randomly searched. This made crossing the checkpoint much easier. The journey to the next town took the rest of the day but they didn't have a place to stay this time. When they got into town, Lee asked around for accommodation and was able to secure two rooms in an old empty home owned by an old couple next door. Natsum repeated her nighttime scouting and finally managed to get a lead. There were many shinobi coming in and out of old mining facility that was said to be completely depleted. However, when Natsum investigated the mine, she discovered that it was a tunnel that led to an opening in the mountains. There was a huge gathering of shinobi with a camp set up. Natsum realized something at that point that was bad news for the Uchiha, Abarame, Inuzuka, and Hayuga. Why do they only have sensory clans? This is bad. She quickly escaped before anyone caught her. When she made it back to her temporary abode, she wrote a message to Tajima. However, when her manjikyo was activated, she sensed a small chakra source under her clothes. Damn it. She quickly escaped out into the rice paddies and used the subterranean travel jutsu to hide underground. The insect couldn't survive long underground and was quickly smothered to death. Natsum sensed hundreds of chakra signatures above her. She quietly held her breath and tried to enter a selfless state to decrease her presence. Equals 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 equals. 8 oh chapters left. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Oh, 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 you need to calm down. You're being too loud. Why do you think they gathered so many sensory ninjas? Hehe. <laughs> Chapter 45, Trail Discovered. The first day of farming, Natsum turned out to be a natural. Her earth release affinity made her move through the mud like she was an eel. Lee was surprised at her talent but just assumed she had experience farming. It wasn't rare for kids to help their parents as soon as they were able. After working for a whole day in the sun, Natsum was only able to plant an eighth of the field. She realized just how big the fields were. It was no wonder that Lee made so much, the yield must be astronomical. Lee had done about twice as much as her, and Saya had just been preparing the seeds for planting. Seeing how diligent Natsum was, the duo was quite satisfied. Saya decided to make a big dinner tonight for the two hard workers. Some neighbors had come by occasionally and saw the speed Natsum was working and were also shocked. It was like finding an ugly duckling only to discover it was actually a golden goose. They enviously left back to their own duties. The family of three was unbothered by these jealous neighbors and continued their day-to-day -day activities. The family environment was always happy and joyful. It gave Natsum an experience she never had before. While she worked the fields, she sensed herself come closer to nature. 2. In her memories, no one had ever been able to master Senjutsu in the Uchiha's history except for the last Indra reincarnation Suzuki. However, his mastery over Senjutsu was more artificially created through experimentation. Based on her experience so far, Natsum wondered if the nature of Uchiha being shinobi by birth prevented them from ever integrating with nature. Since Senjo Hashirama was a wood release user, his proximity to nature was at the peak. It took the family a week to completely plant and flood the rice fields so that they could begin growing. However, the process wasn't finished because weeds and pests would invade the patties that needed to be dealt with daily. Lee was very meticulous in examining each corner of the fields and digging out the eels that grew too big to serve up for dinner. After another few days passed, Natsum had another opportunity to scout the territory. Are you sure you don't need me to come? Saya was nervous, looking at Natsum and Lee. The day before, one of their neighbors had come to them in a panic. All of their seeds had failed to germinate, and the head of the household got sick. They begged Lee for help, and he thought this would be a good opportunity to pay them back for covering for them, so he agreed. Auntie, I want to see the other village, we will be fine. Natsum gave her a bright smile. When she moved her head around her long pigtails would dance around cutely. She didn't bother changing her hairstyle since Saya liked it so much except when she was working the field. After some more convincing, they were able to leave together. The journey took the whole day so they would stay the night. Fortunately, Lee was a regular customer and had a place to stay in the village. After four hours of silence, Lee finally spoke up. Some good work. Natsum almost burst out in laughter. He was really bad with his words, but she understood his sincerity. He was really awkward and when someone pointed out his feelings, he got shy. She reached out and patted him on the head. He coughed and turned away. She couldn't hold back her giggling. When she was with this family, Natsum felt like a simple farmer instead of a killing machine. However, she would easily become a demon if it meant preserving her clan. A little bit of killing intent slipped out but she stifled it before it affected Lee. Fortunately, his friend in the next town had an extra room for Natsum to stay in so she had some privacy. Once she closed the door, she took out her gear and quickly slipped into the night. Unfortunately, she still didn't discover anything. However, she noticed another checkpoint going further south and wondered if that was a potential direction to explore. She returned before the sun rose and in the morning helped Lee purchase some more germinated rice seeds. However, they encountered a problem, which turned into an opportunity. I'm sorry Lee, I sold all of my stock already. You'll have to go to the next town. Lee looked over at Natsum and considered it carefully. She looked up at him and gave him a signal. He seemed to understand her gesture and then nodded at the man. It's okay. Thank you. They got back on the cart and continued south. 
Fortunately, he carried his register with him in case they were randomly searched. This made crossing the checkpoint much easier. The journey to the next town took the rest of the day but they didn't have a place to stay this time. When they got into town, Lee asked around for accommodation and was able to secure two rooms in an old empty home owned by an old couple next door. Natsum repeated her nighttime scouting and finally managed to get a lead. There were many shinobi coming in and out of old mining facility that was said to be completely depleted. However, when Natsum investigated the mine, she discovered that it was a tunnel that led to an opening in the mountains. There was a huge gathering of shinobi with a camp set up. Natsum realized something at that point that was bad news for the Uchiha, Abarame, Inuzuka, and Hayuga. Why do they only have sensory clans? This is bad. She quickly escaped before anyone caught her. When she made it back to her temporary abode, she wrote a message to Tajima. However, when her manjiku was activated, she sensed a small chakra source under her clothes. Damn it. She quickly escaped out into the rice paddies and used the subterranean travel jutsu to hide underground. The insect couldn't survive long underground and was quickly smothered to death. Natsum sensed hundreds of chakra signatures above her. She quietly held her breath and tried to enter a selfless state to decrease her presence. Equals 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 equals. Eight oh chapters left. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Oh, 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 you need to calm down. You're being too loud. Why do you think they gathered so many sensory ninjas? Hehe. He. Chapter 47, New Plan. Hundreds of people were instantly turned to ash as they were swallowed by the inferno. The grass and ground turned molten, and the sky was filled with a column of white smoke. The smoke blotted out the sky and ash began to rain down around her. The Susanoa was barely able to withstand the inferno but the heat emanating round her caused her hair to get sweaty and plaster to her neck. She looked around the battlefield and saw there were some shinobi who survived due to luck and quick reactions. However, they had lost most of their body mass from the flames they were caught up in. She walked over after withdrawing her Susanoa and used their own weapons to finish them off. She heard some people mumbling, Onryo, stay away, forgive me, Shinigami. After killing all the survivors, she walked back to the small shack that had been torched to the ground. She saw a small piece of fabric float in the air in front of her and took the remaining ribbon on her other pigtail. It had turned red from all the blood, but she didn't care. She tied her hair up in a ponytail and let her bangs fall down over her face. She gave one last look at the ash rain and used Fukakoma to send herself away. When she appeared, several Uchiha came out to surround her. When they saw her cold face and clothes covered in blood, they became nervous. They didn't immediately recognize Natsum until they saw her eyes. Natsum ignored the Uchiha and took out the scroll from her robes. She released the seal and put on her black Uchiha cloak and placed her sword to her hip. Tajima quickly arrived on scene and saw the dead expression on Natsum's face. It wasn't the first time he saw it before from war veterans so he had an understanding of what may have happened. Welcome back, Natsum-chan. I am glad you're here. I have some questions about the intel you've shared with us. Tajima tried to distract her mind, but Natsum's tired expression didn't fade. She simply nodded and followed him to the meeting site. Tajima sighed but didn't know what else to say. This was the unfortunate thing about war. There were no winners or losers, only alive or dead. When they arrived, Sahiro saw Natsum and felt a pain in his heart. Her expression was one she wished never to see on her face. She seemed tired of the world. He kept his silence because he had no words of comfort. When everyone arrived, Tajima summarized what they had discovered from their scouting. The information was minimal and mostly about successful raids on supplies. Natsum. He signaled her to talk, and she stepped forward. The clans they hired are Abarame, Ais Unica, Hayuga, and Senjo. The mine is through an old, abandoned iron mine that opens up into a valley. They have not begun excavation yet, but their defenses are strong. She went to the regional map and drew the structure and layout of the hidden valley. My theory is they expected an attack. Three sensor clans are excessive, so they must be specifically hired to prevent sneak attacks and infiltration. They did not know the full breadth of my abilities, but now that they know I won't be able to sneak in again. I agree with your analysis. Our attacks have not been nearly as successful as I was hoping, and this is mostly to do with every unit having a skilled sensor ninja amongst their ranks. With your information, I have more or less understood the situation. This is why I have already sent someone to leak information to the land of water. The other Uchiha widened their eyes. Everyone at the meeting was a veteran and instantly understood. This was an act of playing the fisherman. The clans in the land of water were the most vicious and had a unique advantage the ocean. The position of the mine was very close to the water, and a full-scale attack from the water would be difficult to defend against. However, this was not guaranteed to convince them to move. It is as you have guessed, we will control the water daimyo with Genjutsu to make a move. In the meantime, we will continue to harass the ninja on the borders and block supplies. We will wait for the land of water to attack and cause mutual damage, then we will sweep in and scoop up the gains. Some of the Uchiha were skeptical, including Natsum. This was starting to get more convoluted by the day. However, she had faith in Tajima. At least until Madara grew up and took over, she wouldn't try to interfere with the leadership of the Uchiha. As long as the clan wasn't at risk of extermination, it was all just a symptom of the period they lived in. After Tajima dismissed everyone, he took Natsum to the side and had a special request for her. I need to return to the clan for a while. I want you to take command. You know the most about the plan and the enemy. Natsum frowned but nodded her head. It was true that their ideas were similar up until now, but she was starting to think that retreat and giving up on this mine was the better plan at this point. Instead of risking more deaths on their side, it would make more sense to consolidate their power and wait to be hired again. However, she didn't know the current state of the Uchiha, and seeing how much Tajima pushed for this plan, she felt that there may be some things behind the scenes she wasn't aware of. The Uchiha aren't broke, are they? Natsum wondered after Tajima left. Such a concept was surreal but after experience a poor life for a few weeks, she wondered how the prideful Uchiha would cope. However, thinking of her fake family again caused her to feel nauseated. Equals 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 equals. Six oh chapters left. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. And another one. I've been having a lot of fun writing this story so far so I hope you guys like it. There's been ups and downs, mostly downs, but I'm sure we'll start seeing more happy moments eventually. Chapter 48, Senjutsu Training. Sahiro-san, take over while I am gone. I need to do some training. 
Natsum tracked her father down and passed the leadership baton over. She didn't think it would matter in the end, and felt that Tajima was just using this as a chance to prop Natsum up on a pedestal. The intention to groom her was not missed by Natsum. However, she was destined for greater things. 1. After traveling through the forest for a while, she found a cave with a natural spring. After killing the inhabitant, a giant bear, she took a seat by the water and began to focus on her surroundings. After sensing the nature around her, she was satisfied. She bit her thumb and activated the summoning jutsu for Tejutsuim. The pattern appeared on the ground, and a puff of smoke quickly appeared and faded. However, instead of appearing as a snake, or even at the point of summoning, she appeared as a shrine maiden in the spring water, bathing. She tilted her head backward and looked at Natsum. Her eyes showed a devious look and she licked her lips with a very long tongue. The scene gave Natsum a slight shiver. She stepped out of the water and walked over to the bear. 1. It's acceptable. Her human mouth hinged open like a snake, and she swallowed the bear whole. It was disgusting to watch but became more frightening when the bear disappeared into her small body. She patted her mouth with her sleeve and walked back to Natsum's side. Natsum sat still without moving a muscle and just watched. Tejitsuim stuck her tongue out and licked the side of Natsum's face. Yes, this is the feeling. You are closer to my favorite flavor. Just a little bit more. She teased but Natsum's expression was the same tired look. The lack of reaction caused her to get bored, so she just sighed and waved her hand. Okay, what do you need this one's help for? Assist me in mastering Senjutsu. Natsum didn't beat around the bush and directly asked. Tejitsuim contemplated for a while before having a snake-like smile on her face. Of course, I can help, but if you fail, you'll turn into a snake forever. Are you willing? Her mischievous grin made Natsum grimace slightly. However, she wasn't worried because she didn't need the venom of the Ryukai Cave White Sage to perceive nature energy. She just needed someone to protect her while she took the energy into her body, at least until she mastered it herself. 1. Just watch my chakra levels and pull me out if I go out of balance. The trauma she experienced on the farm had matured her very quickly. She realized that if she did not prioritize getting stronger, she would just put more loved ones at risk. She had a fountain of knowledge at her disposal and all she did was plan and wait for the best opportunity. Rather than waiting, she had finally decided to fully pursue strength. Tejitsuim crossed her arms and gave Natsum a skull, but she ignored it and went into a meditative state. It did not take her long to feel the nature around her compared to the first time. The energy was very obvious and in no time, she made contact. This was the first time she took nature energy into her body on purpose with full control. Once the gates were open, the energy flowed in without stopping. She had to exert a lot of control just to prevent herself from instantly becoming petrified. Foolish human child, that won't work. Are you trying to kill yourself? Tejitsu mumbled but she was shocked at the progress Natsum made with nature energy. She had intervened once the first time Natsum accidentally grasped the state of mind needed to sense nature energy. However, since then she was on her own. She watched for a bit longer before no longer being able to hold back. Her head transformed with more snake-like features, and she bit Natsum on the neck. The venom coursed through her veins and calmed down the ravaging nature energy. However, seeing the rate of consumption of chakra, Tejitsuim realized it wouldn't be enough. She acted quickly and reverse summoned the two of them to the Ryukai Cave. Instead of interrupting her state, it only increased the rate of her nature absorption since the Ryukai Cave was rich with nature energy. Natsum went from slowly losing to the nature energy, to just barely being overtaken by it, then to a sudden increase in invasion. She sensed that the concentration of the surrounding energy had changed and could barely hold herself back from absorbing too much. Her chakra was depleting quickly and she couldn't stop the rampaging nature energy. Her only hope was that Tejitsuin would make a move at the last moment. 3. Fortunately, nothing was wasted during her meditation. She began to understand nature energy more and more while it overwhelmed her. After an unknown amount of time passed, the balance of nature energy and chakra was now leaning toward nature energy. Thus, the petrification started. Natsum tried to stay calm and continued molding chakra in hopes to push back the nature energy. She was already past the point of no return, only an external force or mastery would save her. Use your greatest strength. She suddenly heard a voice in her head. It was an ethereal voice that seemed to reach the depths of her mind, piercing through her selfless meditative state. Natsum didn't take long to understand and activated her Manjiku Sherinan. Yin chakra flowed in excess and pushed out the nature energy. The Dojutsu power was driving out the nature energy instead of forming a balance. 1. Natsum did not know if the Sherinan was incompatible with nature energy, but if Baijuyu chakra could become compatible, then she refused to believe she couldn't find a way for her Dojutsu to do the same. After a long tug of war, the nature energy around her was cut off and extracted just as her Dojutsu and chakra ran dry. Natsum woke after a while to find herself in a pool of water. Equals 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 equals. Regular chapter, O chapters, 6. Two unique reviews plus one chap. Top 10 power stones, plus one chap. Top 3 power stones, plus one chap. First rated in power stones, one slash day while first base rate. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Let's go with Sage Manjiku Sherry non mode. Chapter 49, Passing of a Legend. Wait who is that pretty Uchiha on the cover of the book. 13. Thinking back to the experience, Natsum realized how reckless she had been. If not for the intervention of the White Snake Senin, she would likely be dead now. However, the aggressiveness of nature energy was beyond her expectation. The feeling of it entering her body gave her great strength, but it seemed to be a terrifying destructive force rather than a neutral force. Natsum wondered if perhaps her method wasn't correct, or if this was another extension of the Uchiha's inability to master Senjutsu. Other than the stone tablet at the Naka Shrine, there were no other records that went back at a certain point. Therefore, she didn't really know the full history of the Uchiha or if anyone had attempted Senjutsu before. However, since they were all descendants of Rakudo Senin, there should have been the occasional Senjutsu gifted Uchiha. Natsum lifted herself out of the pool of water and dried herself off. She looked around the cave and didn't see Tejitsuim. She didn't think anything of it and left the cave. There was one person that she could ask about the history of Uchiha. When she arrived previously, she had sensed his chakra in the area, so she knew he hadn't left for the clan yet. 
She moved silently through the forest and realized that her perception had increased. Hideyoshi Sama. Natsum arrived in front of the old Achiha. He seemed to have aged even more since the last time she saw him. She could sense the vitality in him was quickly dwindling. This was not something she could do before, and assumed it was part of the new perks of having partial understanding of Senjutsu. When he heard her call out to him, he smiled and gestured for her to come closer. Natsum Chan, what brings you to visit this old man? He was sitting by himself in a small clearing. Natsum stepped forward and frowned. Hideyoshi Sama, I had some questions about our history. He had passed on a lot of information, but most of it was core understandings of the clan's history. Have there ever been any Achiha that mastered Senjutsu? Hideyoshi was slightly startled by the question and even opened his eyes. The pale white eyes looked her direction and he hesitated for a moment. There have been none to my knowledge, well. Please Hideyoshi Sama, anything will help. I am sure you have already learned of our origins. One day the previous keeper told me a story of our distant ancestor, the founder of Ninjutsu himself. He had said that one day, Rakudo Senin awakened Sherinan and was later taught Senjutsu by the Toad Senin. However, I have never heard of these toads in my time, so they may be a myth. Natsum pondered for a while. The toads of Mount Mayaboku were definitely real, so this was a potential lead. Thank you, Hideyoshi Sama. She thought back to her inherited memories and only ever saw Rakudo Senin with a fully evolved dojutsu. He was known for the Rinnegan and Natsum had not considered the evolution path for the Sherinan to be something shared by Rakudo Senin as well, since he was such a powerful figure in her memory. He had combined Sherinan and Senjutsu, so there had to be a way. If your goal is to learn Senjutsu, you may be the first Achiha. However, you would not be the first shinobi to try this path of strength. Perhaps you may find more luck in other clans' archives. Hideyoshi knew her Manjiku abilities enough to understand her ability to infiltrate the enemy's camp was unparalleled. Natsum's mouth went slightly agape when she heard that. It was such a simple idea that she hadn't considered it. Perhaps it was her distorted perception that she held the most knowledge in the world, or her knowledge of the future that made her see other clans in a more friendly light. Regardless, seeking answers from the other clans was a perfect solution since she did not want to rely on the animal senin. Hideyoshi sama? That's brilliant. However, Natsum, who was lost in her thoughts, only just noticed something strange with Hideyoshi. He had a light smile on his face, and he was slightly slumped to the side. She walked up to him slowly and lowered her head. She closed his slightly open eyes and laid him down. She knelt by him and silently mourned his passing. 2. It did not take long for the others to discover his passing and soon everyone that wasn't on a mission came to the little clearing in the woods to mourn for the old Uchiha. Eventually, one of the older members spoke some words about Hideyoshi's achievements and his body was covered with a cloak before a small team took him back to the ancestral grounds. Once everyone had already cleared out, Natsum was the only one remaining on the ground. After the sun had already set, Sahiro came to her side and kneeled down next to her. He didn't say anything and just silently stayed with her. The next morning, she stood up and stretched her body. Natsum was sad at first, but realized that Hideyoshi passed away peacefully on his own terms. A strange feeling welled up in her that caused her to smile at the rising sun. She put her hand in front of her face as if grabbing the rays of light. I hope you found your light again, Hideyoshi-san. I think you have helped me find mine. Hopefulness was something she had not experienced since she was a child. Unknowingly, that moment had renewed her dwindling determination. Father, I need to go. I don't know when I'll be back. Natsum turned to look at her father with a small smile on her lips. Sahiro saw his daughter's expression and his anxieties were washed away in an instant. Go, I'll explain it to Tajima-sama. Natsum nodded and turned away to leave. The clan will always be your home. And, then she flickered away. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Sorry for the late chapter, actually I wrote two, but then I didn't like them, so I deleted them dead. This one hits better chef kiss. Also who likes the big surprise? Hehe. <laughs> he. Chapter 50, New Lanes. A kunao weaved between the trees as if it were being controlled. An imperceivable steel wire was attached to the base if it guiding the trajectory. A bird flew away narrowly evading the blade, but the kunao suddenly turned, pulling the steel wire around the bird's leg. The kunao stabbed into the tree branch and held the bird down. It flapped its wings repeatedly and realized it was futile before landing on the branch to catch its breath. Natsum appeared from the shadows and grabbed the bird before freeing it from the wire. She placed it under a genjutsu to make it relax and then molded chakra on the tip of her finger. The bird watched her without reacting, an illusory sherry non appearing in its eyes representing its controlled state. When her finger touched the bird's body, a series of funjutsu seals spread across its body. The brown feathers of the bird were nearly turned black by the seals. After they finished expanding, they immediately retracted and only a single spiral remained at the point of contact. Natsum looked at it and shook her head. Another failure. She placed the bird under a deeper genjutsu and sent it off. The bird flew on its own toward the Uchiha clan with a single command. This was the hundredth bird Natsum captured and experimented with. After going off on her own to train and seek knowledge, she had a sudden bout of inspiration watching a flock of birds flying in a strange oscillating pattern. Birds had the ability to detect direction and were able to fly with a group without colliding with each other. Using this principle, she theorized a funjutsu seal that could transmit its spatial coordinates to her. However, it proved to be much more difficult than she expected. She looked through her memories and thought of the flying ray jutsu invented by Tobirama. Her idea had a similar principle, but she didn't need to travel through space, only save the coordinates. Despite removing a major portion of the jutsu, she still was unable to accomplish even a partial success. However, she did determine that the principle of the flying ray jutsu was built around the summoning jutsu. Unfortunately, recreating the summoning formula proved to be hundreds of times more difficult than the storage scroll formula. She would frequently retrieve the contract with Tejutsuim and examine it. After a slight adjustment, she would then capture another bird. Natsum had considered finding a bird with intelligence and chakra and then signing a contract with it to use as mobile spatial coordinates, but even in the most chakra-dense area of the land of fire, she couldn't find a bird that met her criteria. Additionally, if she could master the core of the summoning formula, she could adapt that knowledge to other funjutsu. Another hawk was quickly captured, and she repeated the same action as before. Unfortunately, the result was the same failure. Natsum sighed and sent this bird to the Uchiha clan as well. All the failed experiments were given the task of protecting Madara. Although they were normal birds, the sheer numbers could create an opportunity in a pinch. This was also a way for her to train her genjutsu skills. She turned her head to the north and saw the edge of the forest quickly approaching. Soon, she would enter the land of wind. 
3. After leaving the camp in the east, she traveled for 20 days nearly non-stop to get to the border. Based on her inherited memories, she would be coming up to a natural river that bordered the land of wind and land of fire. It seemed to be known as the land of rivers in the future, but currently it was just divided between the two major territories. Natsum stopped at the edge of the forest and looked down the sheer cliffs with a fast-moving river below. Natsum decided it would be a good time to rest so she made a small camp. The remaining light of the day quickly faded and the moon appeared above her in all of its glory. She thought of the time and realized that the spring months would begin in earnest soon. Natsum closed her eyes and felt the nature energy around her. She didn't take any into her body, only practicing feeling its existence. Like this, morning quickly came while she meditated. Stop hiding and come out already. Natsum opened her eyes lazily and said loudly. She didn't even bother getting up off the ground. Several dozen shinobi dressed in official uniforms surrounded her. Although she was only a child, they didn't underestimate her and were all fully armed and ready to attack. The leader stepped forward, but before he could even speak, Natsum continued. I am looking for work. Natsum flared her chakra to show off her strength. Some of the weaker shinobi stepped back in fear. A child with mid rank chakra reserves was a frightening existence. If they could not be used, they would be eliminated. The leader thought for a few moments before signaling his men. Very well. We will escort you to the daimyo's castle. The meeting was not accidental. Natsum purposefully chose her path knowing that the wind daimyo's guards patrolled this area. The land of wind had very limited fertile soil, and any threat to their food source would be high priority. The direction she was heading was exactly that area. However, she underestimated the distance the guards patrolled. They had been following her in the land of fire for at least a day. Fortunately, she had long disguised herself as a vagrant mercenary. There were many minor clans in the world and it was not unheard of for the stronger clans to let their children off on their own to learn about the world. That was why Natsum limited the strength she revealed to mid-rank. Anything higher would be too suspicious. There were only a handful of clans that could produce such a talent and with her features it would be easy to deduce her identity. Creator's thoughts. Peng incognito. Sorry for the late chapter. I was given the okay from my doctor so I went on a little vacation. I'm back now. Comment. Six comments. Vote. One left.